Welcome to the Huberman Lab Podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. I'm Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. My guest today is Dr. Bonnie halpern felsher Dr. Bonnie halpern felsher is a professor of pediatrics and adolescent medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. A developmental psychologist by training, Dr. halpern felsher is a world expert in the risk behaviors that adolescents, teens, and young adults participate in. Today, we discuss nicotine use, both by way of smoking, as well as vaping and e-cigarette use. We also discuss cannabis and some of the correlative as well as possibly causal data linking cannabis use to psychosis in young adults. And we discuss some of the other common risky behaviors that adolescents, teens, and young adults participate in, including risky driving behavior, alcohol consumption, and risky sexual behavior. We discuss the various factors that impact whether or not a young person will participate in risky behaviors, including the family and home, as well as peer group and social media. And as we discuss social media, we get into a deep discussion about how marketing is combining with peer pressure in order to drive youth toward particular risky behaviors. By the end of today's conversation, you will have learned from Dr. halpern felsher the latest research on risk-taking behavior in adolescents, teens, and young adults, and what we can each and all do to ensure that they either avoid these behaviors or if they are already engaging in these behaviors, that we can mitigate some of the potential harms and potentially get them to eliminate these behaviors toward having a life of enhanced mental and physical health. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at Stanford. It is, however, part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost to consumer information about science and science-related tools to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast. Our first sponsor is 8Sleep. 8Sleep makes smart mattress covers with cooling, heating, and sleep tracking capacity. Now, I've spoken many times before on this podcast about the critical need to get sleep, both enough sleep and enough quality sleep. When we do that, everything, our mental health, our physical health, performance in any sports or school, et cetera, all get better. And when we're not sleeping well or enough, all those things suffer. One of the key things to getting a great night's sleep is that your body temperature actually has to drop by about one to three degrees in order to fall and stay deeply asleep. And in order to wake up feeling refreshed, your body temperature actually has to increase by about one to three degrees. One of the best ways to ensure that happens is to control the temperature of your sleeping environment. And with eight sleep, it makes it very easy to do that. You program in the temperature that you want at the beginning, middle, and end of the night. You can even divide the temperature for two different people if you have two different people sleeping in the bed, and it tracks your sleep. It tells you how much slow wave sleep and rapid eye movement sleep you're getting. It really helps you dial in the correct parameters to get the best possible night's sleep for you. I've been sleeping on an eight sleep mattress cover for well over three years now, and it has completely transformed my sleep for the better. If you'd like to try eight sleep, you can go to eightsleep.com slash Huberman and save $150 off their pod three cover. Eight sleep currently ships in the USA, Canada, UK, select countries in the EU and Australia. Again, that's eightsleep.com slash Huberman. Today's episode is also brought to us by Matina. Matina makes loose leaf and ready to drink yerba mate. I often discuss yerba mate's benefits, such as regulating blood sugar, its high antioxidant content, the ways that it can improve digestion, and possible neuroprotective effects. I also drink yerba mate because I love the taste. While there are a lot of different choices of yerba mate drinks out there, I love Matina because, again, they have the no sugar variety, as well as the fact that both their loose leaf and their canned varieties are of the absolute best quality. So much so that I decided to become a partial owner in the company. Although I must say, even if they hadn't allowed me to do that, I would be drinking Matina. It is the cleanest tasting and best yerba mate you can find. I love the taste of brewed loose leaf Matina yerba mate, and I particularly love the taste of Matina's new canned cold brew zero sugar yerba mate, which I personally helped them develop. If you'd like to try Matina, go to drinkmatina.com slash Huberman. Right now, Matina is offering a free one pound bag of loose leaf yerba mate tea and free shipping with the purchase of two cases of their cold brew yerba mate. Again, that's drinkmatina.com slash Huberman to get the free bag of yerba mate loose leaf tea and free shipping. Today's episode is also brought to us by Element. Element is an electrolyte drink that has everything you need and nothing you don't. That means zero sugar and the appropriate ratios of the electrolytes, sodium, magnesium, and potassium. And that correct ratio of electrolytes is extremely important because every cell in your body 
but especially your nerve cells, your neurons, relies on electrolytes in order to function properly. So when you're well hydrated, and your hydration also includes the appropriate ratios of electrolytes, your mental functioning and your physical functioning is improved. I drink one packet of Element dissolved in about 16 to 32 ounces of water when I wake up in the morning, as well as while I exercise. And if I've sweat a lot during that exercise, I often will drink a third Element packet dissolved in about 32 ounces of water after I exercise. If you'd like to try Element, you can go to drink element, spelled L-M-N-T dot com slash Huberman, to try a free sample pack. Again, that's drink element dot com slash Huberman. And now for my discussion with Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felsher. Dr. Halpern Felsher, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. We're going to talk about a very important and sometimes troubling period of life. Not always troubling, but I think for everyone, adolescence and the teen years, youth essentially, is a tricky landscape. Yes, it is. It yeah. can be. Yeah. As our brain and bodies mature, we have more autonomy in where we take them. But that means also more exposure to the ideas, suggestions, actions, peer pressure of others. And um, that's sometimes where the, the problems arise. And who knows, probably also where the solutions come from, too, from time to time. But I think as conscientious people um, who mind the well-being of others of our species, we'd all like to know sort of like, what are the key features that mark this stage of development? Maybe we'll just start off by talking about this through the lens of um, your expertise as a developmental psychologist. You know, what is adolescence and the teen years? Like what's going on? Um, what sorts of things are being worked out psychologically um, that we might not be aware of? And then we can talk about some of the common pitfalls and the risk-taking behavior, everything from smoking, vaping, drug use, um, sexual behavior, uh, addictive behaviors as it relates to social media, bullying, risky driving. There's so much there. But uh, maybe we could just look at this stage of youth through the lens of a developmental psychologist and share with us anything you feel is worth worth knowing. Sure. So first of all, ages. Adolescence uh, can be anywhere from start, starting roughly around age 10. Some people would say ending around age 18, maybe 21. If you want to go into young adulthood, then maybe mid-20s. And really, adolescence is a wonderful time of as you said, exploration. It's a time when, first of all, marked by pubertal changes, onset of menses for girls, um, uh, and, and really the pubertal and physical development, se secondary sexual characteristics are coming out. We also have a lot of emotional development going on during this time. Height changes are occurring during this time, but we're getting a lot of social changes as well. As you said, peer pressure is so one misnomer is parents think that they don't matter during adolescence. They still really matter. But peers also come in and matter quite a bit. And then teens are really trying to figure out who they are. You get a lot of questions. Who am I? Where am I going in life? What do I want to do when I grow up? What's important to me? How do other people feel about me? And then how do I feel about other people? So a lot of the social and psychosocial development is happening as well. And you get asynchronous development too if a young person, for example, starts puberty at a younger age, say 10, where they're physically looking older, more mature, but emotionally and psychosocially, they still might be young versus the late matures, physical matures who may be not having and looking like an a, a older teen or an adult till 16, 17, 18, but they're more mature emotionally than others, then you might have some confusion to that young person. I look older, but I don't feel older and stuff like that. But it's really this wonderful time of exploration for an adolescent and a time of really wanting autonomy and wanting to make a lot of decisions that we should like them make, but there are some risks that we have to be careful about at the same time. I've often heard this word autonomy as it relates to this uh, stage of you know, puberty and the teen years. You mentioned that kids of that age still really need their parents. Um, you know, in the last, gosh, 20, 30 years in this country, there's been a marked increase in the frequency of divorce. Um, is there any direct evidence that single parent homes or homes where, I don't know, people are remarried or just basically divorced homes are somehow um, 
creating more challenges in terms of risk-taking behavior in adolescents and teens or, um, or not? Because I know plenty of people who had, you know, grew up in single-parent homes, um, sometimes parents remarried and sometimes didn't. And I, by my mind, I can't seem to come up with any direct correlation. You know, plenty of uh, those kids did fine and plenty of kids in uh, two-parent homes that I know had, had challenges and, and vice versa. Yeah, I haven't contributed. Actually, that was some of my earlier dissertation work, and I haven't really contributed to that literature for a while. But what you're saying is is pretty accurate to what I've seen, which is really the literature would say it's not the divorce per se, it's the conflict that is happening. So if parents actually get divorced, usually if the conflict resumes, teenagers and children generally do well, and particularly within about two years. If the conflict uh, resolves. If the Sorry. conflict resolves, yeah. right. So you can have two parents who are married and living in the same home and may or may not be a good relationship, but living in the same home. If there's no conflict or that, uh, then generally teens will do well. Or as you're saying, there's not necessarily a direct correlation. The problem comes in whether parents are living at home together or separated or divorced is if there's conflict. And then that conflict tends to result in social issues, emotional issues, a lot of social anxiety, a lot of feeling like I need to do better so that way my parents like me more. And we see that with children too. That's not just adolescents. A lot of depression and with depression can come self-medication, uh, self-medicating around other drugs and so on. But that generally is resolved if the conflict resolves. But as you're saying, we're seeing adolescent angst regardless of parenting. Uh, what we really need, though, it's not a matter of just the divorce or not divorce or the relationship between the parents. It's parenting that's important. So parents being good monitors, being involved in their kids' lives, not this, oh, you're 16, you have a car, you can go wherever you want, and we're not going to keep an eye on you. We still need parents to monitor, to pay attention, to find out their kids' friends, where are they going after school, uh, that discretionary time when parents are working and teenagers come home between three and five or three and six tends to be the most risky couple of hours. They're it's called discretionary hours where there's no parent around and we don't always know where those teenagers are hanging out. So that's more important, knowing where their children are and what they're doing and that there's some adult presence, some monitoring, than whether or not they're still in a relationship. My sense is that smartphones have allowed more communication and monitoring between parents and kids, but also more interactions between kids and other kids and kids and adults more broadly. So is there any evidence that uh, the advent of smartphones is directly creating problems for kids that um, has to do with just so much more peer-to-peer -peer interaction or peer-to-peer -peer exposure? Like when I was growing up, we didn't have smartphones. Uh, if you did something stupid like that, meaning that kids would laugh at, it, it might get told to a small group of people, maybe a larger group of people. but. Um, in general, it just kind of didn't go anywhere. You're like, oh, I screwed up. And then you'd get teased a bit, and then it would kind of dissipate. But now, of course, that can propagate very, very far, very fast. Is there any evidence that that mere fact is creating issues for, for kids? So I would say it's not a blanket statement. I think it, d it depends on the behavior that we're talking about. Bullying, no doubt, an example that you gave, no doubt that if you mess up, if you do something stupid, it's getting filmed and it's going to go viral. It will go uh, on social media and then it will perpetuate and escalate amongst the peers. Um, that we definitely know is happening. And certainly in terms of drug use and marketing, there there's definitely some peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Look how cool I am. Look at the smoke ring I did. Look at other things that I've been doing. There, there is no doubt. But in general, there are also some good things about it. Parent communication. They can monitor where their children are. They can put a tracker on the phone. Uh, I know with my own kids, sometimes it was the best way to say, you seem a little sad when face-to-face -face communication wasn't happening, I could use the, the phone to have that conversation. So yes, there is some evidence that overall phones and smartphones have increased risk behavior, but it's more the access to the behavior and then the viralness of really getting that information out. Like you said, if somebody screws up, um, somebody dresses wrong, if somebody kisses somebody, that that could go pretty viral. I wouldn't say 
that smartphones and social media as a whole is the problem. I think it's situation specific and behavior specific that we're seeing, and particularly around marketing, for example, that teenagers have more access now to YouTube, to marketing, that they're promoting not only our industries promoting, for example, e-cigarettes or cannabis promoting to young people, but teens are promoting to each other. And that we didn't see before smartphones, right? We didn't see, I took a picture or Instagram, look at me smoking or look at me dressing sexy or look at me looking cool or anything like that. That didn't happen before. It was more just word of mouth. So that is definitely where we're a lot more concerned about social media. Um, but more my concern about social media is the outside world targeting young people. That's where, I, where I've been the, the biggest concern about it. Teenagers targeting each other with bullying, no doubt, big issue. But in other ways, there's more support. There's more social interaction. The other time I get concerned, though, around teenagers is, uh, is more the social piece of sitting around together at a table and they're not talking. They're on the phones. So what we really don't know enough is how is the not getting out and playing and instead playing on a game, not going to the park and, and instead communicating through phones, how is that changing their social and physical development is where I'm also very concerned. Yeah, I uh, have family relatives with, um, who are in their teens, and it's interesting to see them interact um, where they're on their phones uh, a lot of the time. But I've also noticed that there's a cohort of kids that are really trying to put their phones away and just spend time together. And that was actually directly stated to me that, oh, yeah, we hang out and we make it a point not to be on our phones when we hang out. And then, the, But then, of course, they'll text or be on the iPad with one another in the evening when they're apart. So they're sort of never apart. Right. Um, but I do think there seems to be at least a sub-movement of – um, kids and teens that are trying to do more face-to-face -face interaction with devices at least put aside. I answer a really good point. I've talked to some teens who say that they all they get together and they will and deliberately put the phones face down in the middle, no phones, and have dinner or have a conversation. So I, I think you're right. I definitely think that, that that has been a movement, and I really appreciate that, and I think that's fantastic. I've also seen circumstances where two teens are trying to help each other with homework and they're texting each other, which is fine. But I've often said, why don't you just pick up the phone and call the person and in five minutes you can figure out the math assignment instead of 20, 30 minutes of back and forth. It's just not as efficient unless you're literally copying and showing the picture. But is that having a change on their social or physical development or emotional development? Probably not. It's just a different world, the way that they communicate. And that's why I say I'm less worried in some ways, as long as they're still getting out and they're playing and they're being creative, I'm less worried about that kind of social interaction on, on phones and social media. It's a different way. We don't have a lot of evidence to say one way or the other, but if they're still doing the things that they should be doing as young people, my concern is that outside world, the, the um, concern of predatory behaviors, the concern of industry, the concern of m mass media and marketing to teens. That's the part that gets me particularly worried. Yeah, well, we know for sure that this is the first time in human evolution that um, humans have uh, essentially written with their thumbs. There's got to be a massive expansion of the brain's representation of the thumbs relative to you know, 20, 30 years ago. But maybe now would be a good time to talk about risky behaviors uh, or even just behaviors that are known to have some detriment to health. Smoking and vaping and e-cigarettes -cig um, primarily. And we should be probably distinguishing between nicotine and cannabis. Um, maybe let's just start with nicotine. What, what are the statistics on... Um, smoking, vaping, and e-cigarettes, just rough statistics. I, I um, saw a talk that you did online that cited some pretty outrageous increases in um, or shocking increases in smoking and vaping in the last couple of years, just staggering. So maybe yeah. if you give us the top contour of those. Sure, absolutely. So the good news is smoking rates, uh, conventional cigarette smoking rates has gone down pretty dramatically in the last couple of decades with teenagers, with all people in the U.S., which is wonderful, but teenagers to um, well below 10%, if not really well below 5% of teenagers. That's the good news. 
in terms of e-cigarette use, which I prefer the term e-cigarette use than vaping because they're, they're not vapes, they're aerosols, uh, but e-cigarette use has gone up pretty dramatically. So e-cigarettes came on the market in the U.S. in 2007, and they were slow to, to, for uptick amongst teenagers. They looked like cigarettes when they first came on the market. They weren't very popular with teenagers. They didn't have, they had some flavors, not a lot, didn't have a lot of nicotine. It was probably around 2011 to 2014 we started seeing an uptick, but then it was really in 2017 to 19 that we saw a dramatic increase, and that was the the statistics there. We saw upwards of 27 to 29 percent of teens using e-cigarettes during those those couple years. Daily use. Past 30 days, so any use in the past 30 days. Okay. Uh, was and and daily use will be some smaller percentage of that. It was something like a 78% increase in high school student use and a 48% increase in middle school use over those couple of years. So a very dramatic increase in use. Since 2019, it's gone down, but I'm going to give a caveat. It's gone down in 2020 to the national numbers are showing uh, that went to around 20% and now around 10%. Part of that was in 2020, we had covid and initiation of e-cigarette use really occurs socially. I and mean, going back to socialization, it's a lot of teens getting together. And it's not peer pressure of you have to try, come on, try this. It's more like my friends are using, I'm at a party, I feel like using, yeah, I'll try it. Well, during the pandemic and the shutdown, teens were not at school, they weren't with their friends. So initiation went down. Teens who were addicted, and we can certainly talk about levels of nicotine in e-cigarettes, but teens who were addicted continues to use. Some tried to quit, which was great, but we still saw a fair amount of use. So part of the decrease in those 2020 to 2021 have to do with just access and socialization had changed, and so rates went down. Since then, even we published a paper showing relationships between COVID and vaping, we saw Evoli, e-cigarette and vaping associated lung illness. So that, that we think was part of why we also saw further drops around 2021, but people were concerned about their lung health and teens as well, and that's great. The latest data show that the rates are under 10%, the national data. I actually don't think it's true. And the reason I don't think it's true is I'm in the schools doing curriculum presentations all the time where I teach and educate teachers to use our tobacco and cannabis prevention curriculums. And we've never been busier than we are right now with schools just crying for help. We have an out, another group of teenagers using e-cigarettes, nicotine, or cannabis, or whatever. It's way more than 10%. I would say schools are telling me it's 40 to 60% of their students are using e-cigarettes. So for, with, for nicotine? We don't know. Or cannabis? Uh, it's, it's very yeah. hard to know. It's okay. very hard to know what's in there. Uh, but 40 the to is, 60%. That's what the schools are saying. At and some point in the last 30 days. At some point in the last 30 days. They're okay. catching just exorbitant numbers of students using right now. And so from a science perspective, is it 10%, 20%, 30? We don't know. I can just tell you that the national CDC data would say 10%, and maybe it's a problem with the surveys or the questions or teens aren't being honest. But from a school's perspective, it's much higher. And then we have some national data suggesting it's more in the 20 to 30 to 40% range as well. Whatever it is, it's too many. It's too many teens who are inhaling nicotine and, and cannabis as well. Well, a lot to unpack there. First of all, um, nicotine. I did an episode of the podcast about nicotine, um, and a little bit of that got um, confused in the way it landed. Um, so I'll just quickly state uh, nicotine, known cognitive enhancer, also known to dramatically increase blood pressure and vasoconstriction, not healthy for the body, <laughs> just to be clear. It's not healthy yes. for the body. So when people hear that it's a cognitive enhancer, increases focus and alertness, that's true um, in the short term. Highly addictive, highly, highly addictive, um, and habit forming, since sometimes those are separated. Maybe we um, delve into that distinction. But by my observation, very few people can use nicotine occasionally. People who Correct. try it seem to... Um, like it, um, at least in the short run, and keep using it. Um, so 
presumably kids are using, or I should say youth are using nicotine either by vape or e-cigarette, and they quote unquote like the way it makes them feel. Who knows? Maybe it allows them to focus on their studies better. I don't know. Uh, but it is known to improve certain forms of cognition, but only transiently, and it's highly addictive and it's bad for their health, for anyone's health. So that puts us in a kind of a tricky situation when evaluating the statistics that you just uh, laid out because uh, one wonders, you know, are they taking it and then con continuing to take it because of peer pressure, because of lack of peer pressure to not do it, because it helps them with their schoolwork, um, because they're naturally a little bit depressed and it provides a kind of um, antidepressant signal. I mean, w what, what do we know about why they're actually starting and why they're continuing and why they are reluctant to quit? Maybe we just parse those. What, sure. So why does a teenager try nicotine? So it, it, there are a few reasons why they start um, based on the, the literature, scientific literature, and just talking to teens. One has to do with the marketing, no doubt. If you look at the marketing, it is targeting young people. Uh, it's targeting them with First of all, the devices themselves, they are cool looking. Uh, they're easy to hide. They look like USB devices. They look like highlighters. In fact, there's a new brand out called Highlight that is a highlighter. That's a working highlighter, but it's actually an, a nicotine cigarette. Wait, so a highlighter pen to, to study. Highlighter pen to study, and then. but it's actually you take it, the cover off and it's actually a nicotine e-cigarette device. Clearly marketed toward students. Clearly marketed toward students. Wow. You have what's it called? Uh, boba, uh, you know, um, teas, drinks. Oh, yeah, the, the it, tea with the, uh, yeah. Yeah, with the little yep. mimicking that drink that's actually, a, that the straw is actually the vaping inhaling there, little pieces. You have um, Star Wars shapes. You, you know, it goes on and on. Just the cartoon shapes that are clearly being targeted to not just teenagers, children that we're seeing. Ch children like young children? Children like young children. So Wait, so I I'm, I'm, I'm um, shocked. So kids younger than 10 are, are having these products pushed their way? They are. And actually, I didn't tell you in the statistics. The statistics I was uh, citing, I should go back and clarify a couple there to, that are even more shocking. So those are the numbers for middle and high school. We don't have data from elementary. But again, the other part, of, in addition to the science I contribute to, the interventions I do, I am getting elementary school teachers calling us for help. They are catching second and third graders using nicotine cigarettes. I'm not kidding. And not just one or two, quite a bit. We said we would never develop an elementary school version of a vaping prevention curriculum. That's what we call ours, uh, you and me together, vape free. We would never, we have a middle school and a high school. We were never going to do elementary. We've had so many schools across the country call us and say, we need something for elementary. So we actually created a curriculum. So we're having, there, there was a story of an eight-year-old uh, back east who was caught and using, and, and the teachers and police didn't know what to do. And of course, I said, it's not a police matter. Why aren't we helping this young person? So we are, we're, we're seeing younger now. Sometimes they're starting because they're siblings, older siblings. Uh, it's being marketed to. It, they don't realize that it's a nicotine e-cigarette or cannabis e-cigarette. They just don't realize what it is. But the number of these products that are being targeted to young people is absolutely ridiculous what they look like. Uh, the pictures are endless. And the problem is they're coming out with new products every few months that are targeting kids. So marketing. And the other is flavors. And flavors and marketing go hand in hand. You know, it... it if it looks bad, it looks like or and smells like and tastes like nicotine or tobacco, teens know that that's gross. That's why we don't have cigarette use anymore. Teens, we've socialized our country to say if you smell tobacco, it's it's nothing that we want to smell. We walk away from it. You walk across the street, whatever. We've done a really good job in tobacco control, getting the word out around that. These products, e-cigarettes, 
smell and taste like sugar, like sweets, like dessert, like candy. So you've got, and, and the names are things like unicorn poop and sugar booger and honey doo doo. That's not for adults. Those names are squarely for kids. It's kids who are using chocolate. It's kids who are using these flavors that are on the market. And then the marketing around it are these, I mean, they're beautiful. There are these, you know, pizzazz of pineapple dancing around or, of, you know, um, uh, strawberries dancing or whatever it is that are very animated. There are juice box style that, uh, that have come out, juice box style vaping devices that are marketed looking like juice boxes. Again, that's, that's not targeting you and me. That's targeting a kid. Interesting and uh, scary uh, to hear all this. I'd like to take a brief break and acknowledge our sponsor, AG1. By now, most of you have heard me tell my story about how I've been taking AG1 once or twice a day, every day since 2012. And indeed, that's true. I started taking AG1 and I still take AG1 once or twice a day because it gives me vitamins and minerals that I might not be getting enough of from whole foods that I eat, as well as adaptogens and micronutrients. And those adaptogens and micronutrients are really critical because even though I strive to eat most of my foods from unprocessed or minimally processed whole foods, it's often hard to do so, especially when I'm traveling and especially when I'm busy. So by drinking a packet of AG1 in the morning and oftentimes also again in the afternoon or evening, I'm ensuring that I'm getting everything I need. I'm covering all of my foundational nutritional needs. And I, like so many other people that take AG1 regularly, just report feeling better. And that shouldn't be surprising because it supports gut health. And of course, gut health supports immune system health and brain health. And it's supporting a ton of different cellular and organ processes that all interact with one another. So while certain supplements are really directed towards one specific outcome, like sleeping better or being more alert, AG1 really is foundational nutritional support. It's really designed to support all of the systems of your brain and body that relate to mental health and physical health. If you'd like to try AG1, you can go to drinkag1.com slash Huberman to claim a special offer. They'll give you five free travel packs with your order, plus a year's supply of vitamin D3 K2. Again, that's drinkag1.com slash Huberman. What percentage of adults in the U.S. vape or use e-cigarettes, just by way of comparison? So I've seen numbers anywhere from 5% to around 20%, depending on the statistic. I actually haven't looked at the latest data on, on adults. Um, but the majority of adults who are using, uh, it's a little bit different to think about it. Adults are using, generally, they're not initiating tobacco through e-cigarettes. They're generally, and I'm talking 30 and up, they generally have been smoking cigarettes, and then maybe they're trying to use e-cigarettes to quit, which is a whole other uh, set of literature that it's not necessarily as effective as we're hoping that it is. There isn't good literature on a population level that e-cigarettes help adults quit uh, cigarettes. The difference with teenagers is they're initiating with e-cigarettes, and they're not saying, huh, here's a cigarette, here's an e-cigarette, which one do I choose? It's not that they're substituting or replacing. They're not using cigarettes. Some are now because they're switching back and forth, but they're initiating with e-cigarettes. They're initiating because of the marketing. They're initiating because of the flavors and the products and the ability to hide it. Parents don't know what these products look like. So the landscape is very different. So you were telling us why teens and adolescents start vaping. Right. The marketing is clearly oriented toward them. There are a number of reinforcing factors that, at least to my mind as you're describing all this, make it sound like this stuff is supposed to be, quote unquote, playful, that it's, it's not... Um, it's not a drug, that sort of thing. It reminds me a little bit of sugary cereals. Yeah. Like when I was a kid, yeah. you'd buy this, the cereal because you wanted the taste, but you also wanted the colorful box. You had the, you know, the cartoons that it related to on TV, and there's usually a toy inside that you wanted, some surprise that you could then collect across boxes. So there was a lot of levels of incentivization. Why do they keep smoking or vaping? Are they addicted to nicotine? Yeah, absolutely. So, so... The other reason why they start is they like the taste and they like the rush. Oh, right. So I've yeah. talked to, so that's the other pieces. So a few more reasons why they start and then and then certainly answer your question around the nicotine. Um, teens have told me 
outright that they like the taste, they like the rush, they like the buzz. And we could talk about how much nicotine is in there. It's astonishing, and I can explain that. But they like the buzz. They, they, another reason, by the way, is stress and coping. Right now, teens are so stressed out. They've, they've been stressed out for years, but they're particularly stressed with the pandemic. And even though we're a couple years out of the lockdown, teens are still, they're having socialization issues, social emotional learning issues. They're still confused. Uh, they missed a couple of years, particularly high school students may have missed part of middle school where you're learning to socialize with other people. So they're very stressed, and we know that there's a pretty strong relationship between stress, not being able to cope, and using any drug, but including nicotine. So there's a lot of different reasons why young people, and certainly the peers, and again, it's not peer pressure, it's more like a lot of friends are using it. I've talked to teens who say, I wasn't intending on, but I tried it, and wow, I really like the taste, I like the flavor. And then there's the amount of nicotine that's in there. In 2015, when the newer products came on the market, it was a salt-based nicotine. So cigarettes and then earlier e-cigarettes have a free-based nicotine. Free-based nicotine uses ammonia and sugar to bind to the nicotine and the other chemicals. There's hundreds of chemicals in there to go through the body, lungs, into the brain and give you that rush. The free-based nicotine is very caustic. If you think the litmus test, it's very much on the basic side of the litmus test there. And if you're a nicotine-naive youth, which again, most teens starting with nicotine e-cigarettes have not used nicotine before, when you start, you don't want that caustic throat hit feeling. That's how it's described. Teens will say they don't like it, they cough, it tasted bad. Well, to an adult who's been using cigarettes, they don't mind that. They're used to it. But a teen is not. Well, I will mention Juul here because it's relevant. Juul came on the market in 2015 with a salt-based nicotine. Which essentially, uh, for those who aren't familiar with caustic and um, litmus tests and things like that, the salt-based nicotine, as I understand, is quote-unquote smoother. It's, Correct. It's, um, it causes less uh, sort of coughing um, static contraction of the, the, the muscles in the mouth and throat, you know, and so it, it's basically more palpable, more of a, of a kind of gradual on-ramp, yeah. which is exactly what a company wants um, if you want somebody to start using something. You don't want to hit them square in the face. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So salt-based nicotine generally uses benzoic acid to move that litmus test needle from the caustic towards acidic because it's a, it's an acid, but really towards neutral. So exactly. So when you use it, it's smooth. It's easy to use. You don't have that throat hit. You don't cough. You don't feel sick from it. So teens will say, and I, I've talked to teens and young adults who tried earlier e-cigarettes and didn't like it and then tried the salt-based style and said, ooh, I like it, coupled with the flavors. It's also more absorbent. So there's some suggestion and some early evidence that it's also more addictive. So when those products first came on the market, before earlier e-cigarettes had, say, 0 to 36 milligrams of nicotine, suddenly we jumped up to 59 milligrams per mil, which is about generally about a 40, 41 milligram because uh, it's, it's about a 0.7 mil. Uh, sorry, a little chemistry and math that we do a lot here. But you're looking at, basically, it's anywhere from the nicotine that you see in either one to two packs of cigarettes. Per? Per device, per pod, per e-cigarette device. And how long does a pod typically last? A, let's say like a 15 or 16-year-old kid who's, um, you know, taking a hit off the vape pen. Um, I don't know what. Five times a day? So I've asked teens in some of the earlier publications we did, now uh, not with the newer devices, but the older devices, and they would say that they were using a pod a week, which is about two or three cigarettes a day, to one to four pods a day. One to four pods a day? One to four. Now, these are highly addicted teenagers. That is one to eight packs of cigarettes, depending on the debates on how much nicotine is in there, but you're looking at several packs of cigarettes worth of nicotine. Okay. So just to backtrack a little bit, because yeah. we got a little bit um, technical, um, which is great, but I want to make sure everyone's on board. The amount of nicotine in one of these pods that goes into the vape pen or e-cig is 
significantly greater than the amount of nicotine in one pack of cigarettes in many cases. In many cases. And there are many youth, so adolescents and teens, you said before, between ages of 10 and 21, roughly 10 to 18, 10 to 21, that are going through as many as four pods per day, which has to be at least the equivalent of four packs of cigarettes, but could be as much as eight packs of cigarettes per day. Correct. In terms of nicotine concentration. Correct. Now, I, I guess to be fair, they are not smoking in the traditional sense, so that presumably there's some tars and other contaminants that are not going into their system. But we know that there are a lot of chemicals in these pods besides just nicotine. And I think that's where a big source of the um, debate and interest is now is, you know, how dangerous are those other chemicals is really an interesting question. So um, a lot of things that you said are really important to highlight. Uh, absolutely. Now, not all teenagers are using four pods a day. These are extremely, very highly addicted teens. Uh, and, and unfortunately, teens we've seen with lung collapses and, and other pretty significant health issues. Typically, teens are using maybe a pod a, a, a day. The newer e-cigarettes, by the way, have probably four times that. They're bigger volume, so you're looking at 60, 70 milligrams of nicotine. Some of them are equivalent to about three to 500 cigarettes worth of nicotine. Wow. Now, are they using them in a day? Probably not. We haven't done the studies on that. But it's really the first nicotine product we've had that you can use 24-7. When I've talked to teens, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night, I may check my phone and check my email. Teens are waking up in the middle of the night to take a hit. And they're, they're hiding them under their pillows and their nightstands, whatever, and they're telling me that they're just using them all the time. And they could just suck on them all the time. Are they using – when you say all the time, I, that's interesting. Forgive me for interrupting. No, but no, no. Are they using it specifically to wake up, to study – to um, or just to maintain baseline. I mean, that's the that's the problem with any addictive substance or habit forming substance is that what starts off as a rush becomes less of a rush, and then um, when one doesn't use, they feel below baseline. I've, I've done a lot of discussions about dopamine and baseline versus you know um, non baseline peaks in dopamine, and some of that is smoothed out for general discussion. Uh, dopamine does many things besides set up reward systems and um, incentives in the brain, but it's at least one of the things it does. So are kids starting off taking nicotine and then – and feeling like, whoa, that makes them feel really elevated in terms of mood, focus, and alertness, and then finding that without it, they're just depressed? Is that is – that the general theme. Yeah. I'm not trying to lead the the, the uh, witness here. I just no. want to know what what's what's going on internally. Absolutely, no, no, no. All all great um, questions there. Th so what we're what we're finding when we talk to teens is that pretty rapidly they are going from I like it to I need it. So you know your your multi part question, which is great. What makes them start and what makes them continue? Uh, they start because of the flavors and, and the marketing and they like the, the taste and all that. They continue because of that high level of nicotine. And we are seeing that teens are addicted. And we're seeing, we actually published a couple of studies showing that teens who have been using e-cigarettes in the past 30 days, that the majority are showing signs of addiction pretty rapidly too within a few weeks. It's such high levels of nicotine. And there are some people who don't believe that teens are becoming ni addicted to nicotine and that you, the levels of nicotine are not the same as what we're seeing in cigarettes. That's actually not the case. And we've seen more and more studies. And to the question of using it as soon as they wake up, there's a study by a colleague of mine that showed in the last few years, the, the data are showing that teens, a greater percentage of teens who use e-cigarettes are doing so in the first five minutes of waking. That is a sign of addiction. So you wake up, maybe go to the bathroom, maybe not, and you take that hit. And so a, and all the national data are showing, even though initiation may go down, the percentage of teens who are using daily has gone up. And I attribute that a lot to the type of nicotine, the salt-based nicotine, and to the huge amount of nicotine that's been on the market. So yes, teens are definitely feeling it. They're definitely going through withdrawal symptoms, that that feeling, uh, shaking, the, the sweats, all the feelings that they need, lack of concentration. The problem is when you talk to teens, they they think that e-cigarettes are helping with school. And, and by the way, I've not heard a teen tell me that they started because of school reasons or concentration. 
maybe they're continuing for that reason. But teens have said that taking the hit makes them feel good. What they don't understand is it's that it makes them feel not bad, right? The withdrawal is making them feel bad, and they don't realize that that hit and that that dopamine rush that they now need it, that they're going through withdrawal either way. I'm wondering where they're getting the money to pay for all this uh, <laughs> nicotine. When I was a kid, I worked. Um, I like mowed lawns. I had a newspaper out for a little while, but mostly um, started working when I, I think I was about 14 or so. Coffee shop, skateboard shop, um, bus tables, did that kind of thing. So I made money, and I was able to use that money on the things that were important, music, skateboarding, and bus passes and stuff. That That's what it was back then, food, um, et cetera. Where are 12-year-olds getting the money to buy four or even one vape cartridge? pod, as you called it, um, per day. I mean, someone's got to pay for this stuff. Um, I mean, unless they're stealing it, and I can't imagine that they're all stealing it, where are they getting it? How are they getting it? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's not one way. Uh, in terms of money, I think there's questions around money and questions around access, right? And they're not necessarily the same thing. Money, babysitting. The problem is when some of the newer products came on the market, some of them, the, the say 2020, 2021 products were about a dollar or two per pod. Compare that with a pack of cigarettes, which is 10 to $15, depending on the state you live in. So they are cheap. They're easy to get. Now, Newer ones and older ones are a few dollars more, but they're not that expensive. They started off very expensive when they first came on the market, but they haven't been. The other is the sharing. And we used to hear about pod parties where somebody buys the device, which is more expensive, buys the device, and then you bring your own, not beer, bring your own pod, which is a few dollars, then you pop it in and then you share it around. Um, we've also heard stories of a few teenagers buying them and then selling for a few cents or a few dollars a puff. So meet me in the bathroom for 50 cents or a dollar, you can have a couple of puffs. So I think teens are getting very, very creative. We've also seen, unfortunately, parents buying e-cigarettes for their teens. Well, at least they're not smoking cigarettes. Eh, that's not the right comparison. Um, so I think they're very creative. They're getting in many, many different ways. I've heard students say, I'm not using my lunch money to buy lunch. I'm going to use it to buy vapes. Um, there's no one way. Uh, there, there's not. And unfortunately, access is easier than it should. By the way, one thing I think is incredibly important for people to understand is across the U.S. in 2019, December of 2019, the legal age to be allowed to purchase or to sell nicotine products across the U.S. has is, is become 21. So many people think it's so 18. So you go into a vape shop or a tobacco shop, and if the shop owner doesn't realize it's 21, they'll sell it to somebody who's 18. And even if they know it's 21, they're still selling it because there's not enforcement right now going on. So we really do need our the public. We need all the parents listening. We need educators, police officers to really enforce the and regulate this age restriction because teens are getting them from vape shops really easily. They're getting it online really easily. Um, they're buying them for each other. Somebody's going and buying 10 and, and then reselling them if the person looks older. There's not a lot of carding going on or fake cards, ID cards is pretty easy still to get. So unfortunately, we have a product that is appealing to teens in a very unregulated market right now. The FDA is not regulating it. Local shops are not regulating it. That it's just, it, it is the Wild West out there. So setting aside the issue of whether or not vaping is, quote unquote, better for us than smoking cigarettes, because that argument is um, a complicated one, uh, to say the least. What do we know about the health hazards of vaping, per se? Um, does it increase um, lung disease? Does it increase cancer rates? I mean, um, my understanding is that nicotine, the chemical, is not what causes cancer in cigarettes. It's the tars and other things that um, are consumed or brought into the lungs and therefore bloodstream when one smokes. Um, that's not to say nicotine is safe. 
I have to be careful here. Sometimes yes. it, clips get <laughs> cut and people run wild. And I, I'm not saying nicotine is safe, but um, what are the problems with vaping nicotine? Um, even let's just say one or two hits per day, um, especially in kids. You know, do we do? Are there known challenges for brain development? Are there known challenges for cognitive development? Are there known challenges for um, lung function? Is it? I mean, nicotine is a vasoconstrictor and it raises blood pressure, so that's basically stress on the system, chronic stress. Uh, but you know, what, what do we know about what um, vaping and e-cigarettes are doing to malign health? Yeah. So first of all, I'll start with the brain. And, and nicotine, uh, absolutely, these high levels of nicotine, and really any nicotine, is harmful to the developing brain. And our brains continue to develop until we're around 25, 24, 26, depending, but to around 25. So in that process of, of your brain developing, of your brain changing, if you introduce nicotine, you're changing your brain, you're changing the brain chemistry, and you're so much more likely to become addicted as an adolescent and young, a young adult. The tobacco industry knows this. I mean, they, that's why they target teens. We've known this with cigarettes. If we target a teen, then we're going to have them for life. So significantly more likely to become addicted because it actually rewires your brain. And there's plenty of evidence for that. The, the other pieces that we're worried about is, now you're right, nicotine in terms of cancer, although I will tell you, having talked to some oncologists, they would say the vast amount of nicotine still worries them in terms of cancer. We just haven't had enough research on e-cigarettes to really know. Now you're right, e-cigarettes do not have tar, but e-cigarettes have aldehydes. And aldehydes have been li linked to cancer, so there's still some concern there. There's some early anecdotal evidence, and probably some of my colleagues out there would say, no, no, there's pretty good evidence around cancer. I, we just don't have enough body of research. But again, it took 50 years to figure out cancer in cigarettes. We've not had the amount of e-cigarette use or, or that we saw with cigarettes for that long, for that many people to really know, it's still pretty new. I just might want to just interject yeah. the aldehydes, um, like paraformaldehyde, formaldehyde. These are the same chemicals that we use in laboratories to um, fix, as it's called, tissues, to make those tissues firm so that then they can be cut and analyzed under the microscope. Um, aldehydes cross-link proteins, um, basically change the configuration of proteins and turn what would otherwise be a pliable tissue into kind of a hard rubbery, think of like a dense eraser-like um, consistency. And uh, in other words, not the configuration most conducive for those cells to live and thrive, actually quite the opposite, um, which is why um, that's for sake of doing anatomy on, well, any body part, you use paraformaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, um, and formaldehyde to cross-link proteins. It basically kills tissue by cross-linking proteins, taking a nice, you know, pliable configuration that's uh, amenable to life and twisting the, the uh, or shearing the proteins more or less um, relative cross-linking them and making them nice and rigid. So if that's happening in the living child, that can't yeah. be good. That can't be good. That can't be good. Lugs, bloodstream, everything. Right. And all the aldehydes are, are carcinogens. Co Correct. Co we know they cause cancer. Right. Right. And so that's why there's a lot of concern there. And when I talk to teens uh, and in our curriculum, we, we often say, uh, because when you just say, and you gave a beautiful explanation of the aldehydes, but for a teenager, what I generally say is, is if you ever dissected, a, had biology and you dissect a frog, yes. How did it smell? It was gross. Well, that's what you're putting into your body when you're vaping, uh, because that, that's exactly the point. And, and that kind of helps them understand it a little bit more. But there's a lot of concern around the aldehydes. Uh, there's lead, there's cadmium, there's propylene glycol and glycerin. So there's a lot of other chemicals. So no, we may not have the thousands of chemicals that we have in cigarettes, but we certainly have hundreds of chemicals in an e-cigarette. That's very concerning. So there are a lot of studies now really showing pretty significant effects of e-cigarette use on heart and lungs, a lot. Um, not only all the chemicals we've mentioned, but also the flavorants. There's uh, cinnamon aldehyde, another aldehyde. There's vanillin. There's um, uh, 
what is it, the, the buttery flavor um, that, that's in there is also a lot of concern so that you're inhaling these flavors. And I have a, often explained, you can take flavors, you can take butter and heat it to several hundred degrees and eat it, if you don't burn your tongue, but you then take it and really inhale the resulting aerosol. And then we're seeing the, the lesions on the lungs. We're seeing young people who have been using e-cigarettes, having lung collapses, pneumonia, asthma amongst people who have not had seizures. Uh, one of the teens I know who was using four pods a day was having seizures. Uh, so Makes sense because nicotine is a stimulant. Yes. It can cause runaway excitability in the brain if t too much is taken. Yeah. Um, if 40 to 60% of kids are using e-cigarettes um, and it's destructive to the lungs uh, and it sounds like the brain as well, uh, where are all the young athletes? Are they the, the remaining... <laughs> uh, are they the remaining fraction? Yeah, and, and I should say 40 to 60 is what schools are telling me, and that might just be using once in a while. We don't really know. But even um, kids but just, yeah. like, I had to do PE class when I was in high school. Yeah. Yeah, we had to run a few laps. I can't imagine doing that if you're... Um, if your lungs don't function properly. No, it is actually much harder, and teens will say that. And adults I know. I actually ha I know an adult who said that when he went from smoking cigarettes to e-cigarettes, it actually was harder for him to exercise and to ride his bike and, and, and exercise and do other things on the e-cigarette compared to the cigarettes. Uh, that the the impact on the lungs is so strong. So you're right. It is probably hurting uh, um, athletics right now. Where actually there are some curriculums on athletes and and vaping, and we're building one as well because there's a lot of concern. And when you tell a teen, you know, I'm worried about lung cancer in 20 years. Uh, I don't care about 20 years from now. But you would tell a teen it's harder to run. They're more likely to listen to you. I'd like to take a brief break and acknowledge one of our sponsors, Waking Up. Waking Up is a meditation app that offers hundreds of guided meditations, mindfulness trainings, yoga nidra sessions, and more. I started meditating over three decades ago, and what I found in the ensuing years is that sometimes it was very easy for me to do my daily meditation practice. I was just really diligent. But then as things would get more stressful, which of course is exactly when I should have been meditating more, my meditation practice would fall off. With Waking Up, they make it very easy to find and consistently use a given meditation practice. It has very convenient reminders and they come in different durations. So even if you just have one minute or five minutes to meditate, you can still get your meditation in, which research shows is still highly beneficial. In addition to the many different meditations on the Waking Up app, they also have Yoga Nidra sessions, which are a form of non-sleep deep rest that I personally find is extremely valuable for restoring mental and physical vigor. I tend to do a yoga nidra lasting anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, at least once a day. And if I ever wake up in the middle of the night and I need to fall back asleep, I also find yoga nidra to be extremely useful. If you'd like to try the Waking Up app, you can go to wakingup.com slash Huberman to try a free 30-day trial. Again, that's wakingup.com slash Huberman. We haven't talked too much about peer pressure or just social pressure. Um, I remember when I was a kid, it was in the just say no to drugs <laughs> era. And um, I remember seeing the television commercials with the eggs, like two like really beautiful raw eggs and say, this is your brain. And then it was this your brain on drugs and it was mm -hmm. frying. And, you know, it was Nancy Reagan was the big, right. like, it was everywhere those in that, in that time. You know, just say no, just say no. In any case, um, there must be a lot of data indicating that what messages kids respond to. I was told, and I don't know if this is true, but I was told by a researcher um, that the anti-smoking campaign that was effective in kids was not one that convinced them that smoking was bad for their health, but was one that um, convinced them that it was um, their purchasing and use of cigarettes that was making uh, other people rich and then um, kind of demonizing those people that was effective kind of like show uh, the commercials of, of these guys, um, you know, kind of cackling behind closed doors, you know, making fun of the, the people that were, um, in their words, um, you know, not bright enough to know that, that they were being taken advantage of. And then that set a, a kind of a psychological warfare between teens and these people that they perceived as um, taking advantage of them for money. And that that was effective in getting them to smoke less as opposed to telling them, hey, listen, smoking is really bad for your health. Right. Absolutely. So first of all, the just say no 
not effective. Say just having saying just say no around any behavior to a teenager, whether it's tobacco, cannabis, cigarettes, um, and sex, does not work. It does not work, and for many reasons. First of all, teens are curious, and when you say just say no, why? Well, because it's bad for you. Well, wait a second. Exactly what you're saying. Just telling me that it's bad for me if you tell me I'm going to get lung cancer or I'm going to have lung disease or anything, and I tried the e-cigarette and I didn't have lung problems and instead I actually liked it, then we look bad. We look like we're lying to teenagers. And instead, what we were talking about earlier, the, the feeling, the rush, the flavor, the taste, the perceived and real benefits outweigh the concerns over the risks as a teenager. So when we say to a teen, just say no, don't. And they say, well, why? Well, your brain or your heart or your lungs or it's bad for you. They don't believe us. And, and we absolutely lo- lose credibility. So when we talk to teens, and this is based on decision-making research that I've been doing for 25 years, we have to help teens weigh the benefits and the risk. Now, I don't mean that we say, hey, it's good for you or you're going to like it. Certainly not. But if we only come from a risk model and a just say no model, that never works for teens. We need to help them understand the balance. And and teens know that there are good things about using some drugs, real or perceived, and we can't lie to them on that. So that gets to then how do we have those messages? And you're right. If we only harp on, and, and our research would show this too, the long-term health risks, the, your brain on, on drugs, those kinds of things, that's so far in the future. Or the trach. You know, you're going to have a trach if you smoke, but they're showing the 80-year-old and no 16-year-old even looks at somebody at that age or cares about somebody that's so that other person that – that's the problem. So we need to talk about the social aspects that teens really care about. You you may get wrinkles, although we don't know that so much with e-cigarettes, but, um, but the athletics, the things that are important to teens. Now, the campaigns that you're talking about are really effective as well, particularly the mass campaign, which at level that we see social media campaign, which is, do you realize that the industry e-cigarettes, tobacco, nicotine, cigarette, whatever you want to call it, is targeting you as a teenager on purpose. They want you as a smoker. I used to go to middle school students and say, before e-cigarettes, when cigarettes were of concern, and I I love saying to to young people, 400,000 adults are dying each year from from cigarette use. You're a replacement smoker. And it was great because teens said, would get really angry and said, wait, I, this 12-year-old boy was so cute. Wait, I don't want to be a replacement smoker, Dr. Bonnie. It was a big deal to him. And I, I don't want to give money to the industry. And it's great. Channel that energy and get young people mad. That's what really worked. Showing that the seven dwarfs, we call it the seven CEOs of the t- big tobacco companies at the time said, Nicotine's not addictive. Nicotine's not addictive. There, our cigarettes are not addictive. And that clearly they were lying to teens. You show that to a teen and explain how nicotine is addictive and they knew it, but they're trying to get you. Works really well. And, and same thing with marketing. We, we have a whole lesson on marketing. Do you think that that, that candy was for me as a middle-aged adult? It's for you. And that gets them mad because they don't want to be duped. They don't want to be targeted. That is a much better message. Now, we still have to tell them about the health risks. We absolutely do. They still need the knowledge. They still need to understand what they're doing is unhealthy. But we can't do it in a lecturing way, and we can't do it in a way that makes them feel stupid. We can't tell them their brains are developing till 25, and therefore they're dumb. Our lessons on talking about brain are more like, it's really cool that you're developing. That's why why you can do dance. That's why you can sing better. You can learn language. There's so much that you could do that's really cool that I can't do right now. But because of that, that's why you're so much more likely to become addicted. And the industry knew that. That's why they're targeting you. Those are the messages that work a lot better for teens. Sounds like the the key is to never undervalue the spirit of defiance in youth Yeah, uh, and perhaps to um, wager it. Um, against these t- clearly destructive behaviors. I, to be honest, I'm shocked that um, there's so much vape use and e-cigarette use. I mean, these numbers are staggering. Yeah. 
Maybe we could weave in a discussion about cannabis. Sure. Uh, I did an episode about cannabis. Um, the landscape around cannabis has changed so much since I was a kid. It was highly illegal, at least where I grew up. Um, now I think it's um, been decriminalized certain places, still illegal elsewhere. I don't want anyone getting in trouble um, as a consequence of not understanding what you know the laws in their area. Uh, and outright legal pretty easy to get in a lot of the country. And um, it's not clear that at least with individual use that it's being um, you know, punished as free, nearly as frequently as it used to be. So the you know, 10 word summary of, of the cannabis thing is that the ratio of THC to CBD is important. It is true that a lot of cannabis has much, much higher levels of THC now than in the past, although I'm told that high THC level cannabis always existed. Um, but it seems to be the concentration of THC that is of, let's just say, concern as it relates to the potential development of psychosis um, if there's a predisposition um, as put in terms of the uh, how addictive the cannabis is and so on and so forth, which is not to say that CBD is totally innocuous, but it seems to be like the THC concentration is the kind of the thing that to mainly focus on. So what do we know about cannabis? And here we're going to assume cannabis with a reasonable to high level of THC in it, so not pure CBD. Um, what do we know about vaping and e-cig use of cannabis specifically? Is it true that youth that are taking um, nicotine by way of vape or e-cigarette then transition into using cannabis? Is it sort of a gateway into cannabis use? And how prevalent is cannabis use in kids age 10 to 21? First of all, you're right. I mean, THC levels we're seeing today's joint is about 10 joints when I was a teen. Uh, so the, the dramatic increases in the potency right now that we're seeing around THC. And then you get something like dabbing, which is about 80% THC versus 20 to 30% of, of the more mainstream products that we have on the market. When I say mainstream, I mean like uh, uh, joints or, or e-cigarettes. So the potency has gone up dramatically and it is of concern. So depending on the, the study, you're going to see anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of teens is saying that they're using some form of cannabis, either smoked or in the form of a joint or a blunt. And for those who don't know, a blunt, a lot of people don't realize, is a combination of both tobacco and cannabis. So it's it's a cigar leaf or some people buy a cigar and pull out the tobacco and put in the cannabis or they'll just get the cigar leaf and, and roll the, the f cannabis flower. Then you're getting both the kind of the double whammy and the chaser, the high of both of nicotine and THC. So we're seeing a fair number of it, – and it's interesting. Even though teens are not smoking cigarettes, they're still using joints, which is interesting. Uh, but very quickly increasing uh, is e-cigarettes with cannabis in there. You could buy a cannabis-style – e-cigarettes. And that's been around for a long time with vo volcano vaporizers and specific cannabis vaporizers. That's not new, but it's become much, much more popular. But now we're also seeing teens buy a nicotine e-cigarette, inhale half of it, and then add the, the cannabis wax or oil to it and then basically get the combination. I had one young young teenager, probably 12, 13, 14 year old young man who said, yeah, I, I got a cherry nicotine vape and I inhaled half of it. He probably didn't use the word inhale, but I used half of it. And then I added in some cannabis oil and now I had a cherry flavored cannabis nicotine device. So we're seeing that more and more. And even though you're not technically supposed to, and the manufacturers of nicotine cigarettes will say, don't open them and add stuff, a simple YouTube video will teach you how to do it. Um, and unfortunately, the videos are not using gloves and benzoic acid is coming in your skin and things like that. But Which is bad for... Which is bad. Does it go transdermally? Does it go through uh, the skin? It, it, supposedly it does. Yeah. Yeah. But if, a, if the benzoic acid is going transdermally, uh, presumably when one inhales off one of these pods, they're also bringing benzoic acid into the lungs. Correct. And um, hopefully people realize this from our episodes on breathing, but if not, uh, I'll just make it clear now that when you breathe in a substance, 
you know, a, a uh, airborne substance into your lungs because of the um, interface between the vasculature, the blood supply and the lungs. I mean, basically things pass from the lungs into the blood supply very, very readily. Very quickly. And then if those things are able, they'll cross the blood brain barrier. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And it only takes about seven to 10 seconds to go through the whole system and into the brain too. So it's a very fast process. So yes, so teenagers are definitely uh, vaping or using cannabis, e-cigarettes. And the, the problem is, you know, for one, teens will think it's healthier than just like nicotine e-cigarettes. They think it's healthier than combustible. I mean, yes, you're not burning it, but you're still inhaling and you still are inhaling. There seems to be the propylene glycol, the glycerin, the flavorants, all the aldehydes, even if it's just just a, a cannabis e-cigarette. So there's a lot of concern there. And then addiction is still huge. It's a huge issue when you're talking about cannabis, the same reasons that we talked about with nicotine, the brain development and so on. Psychosis, just a lot, a lot to think about here. Psychosis. Um, there's actually some scientists now who are really strongly saying it's not uh, associated as causal that if you are predetermined to have a mental health issue, psychosis, schizophrenia, then starting to use or using cannabis can actually trigger and cause you to become psychotic. Um, I don't totally understand the mechanism yet. I don't think we totally do yet, but that there seems to be more than just, eh, it might happen. And it seems to be right in that older adolescent, young adult time frame that it is happening. So s around the same time that the brain's developing um, and we're hardwiring the rest of our brain that that change is happening from, from a neur neuronal connection perspective. Um, my understanding, sorry to interrupt, yeah, but yeah, my understanding please. is that indeed um, the use of high THC cannabis in youth, in particular male youth, right. predisposes, and you're saying might even be causal, toward the development of psychotic symptoms correct in late teens early 20s correct and that some of those cases um, are ones in which the psychosis is irreversible correct um, is it sometimes the case that somebody exhibits psychotic symptoms as the consequence of using THC and the psychotic symptoms resolve or is it a, you know some sort of circuit switch that is then permanent you know, it's a good question. I honestly don't really know the answer to that of what, what percentage. Um, the, the few cases I know of in, in talking to the psychiatrist uh, would say that, it, that it's causal and it may be permanent. Now, it could be, it could be managed. It doesn't mean that somebody is going to be having psychotic episodes all the time. I mean, it certainly can be managed. And certainly we would say, please don't continue to use uh, would be very important. But whether it's completely reversible is something that I'm not sure of, uh, somebody more versed in this. But we, you know, in what you do in, in your research and what I know is, you know, changes to the to the neural circuitry is not changeable. You know, when we hurt our uh, brain cells, that is not something that we could recover from. So that is very much concerning. Yeah, as in, as adults, there are very few new neurons added to the brain. Um, there is significant plasticity and recovery of function in some cases, both by virtue of traumatic brain injury. Um, certainly people can get over uh, certain behavioral patterns, and that no doubt involves plasticity, but it, it takes work. And, um, and when it comes to addiction, uh, there's evidence that some of the reward circuitry can adjust. But um, again, it, it takes um, adherence to sp specific things in order to make that happen. Um, I'm very concerned about this uh, potentially causal relationship, but certainly correlation between high THC containing cannabis and psychosis, uh, mostly because we already have uh, a serious problem with psychosis on the planet. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, approximately 1% of the world's population has schizophrenia. And by the way, I have to be careful with the language nowadays, you know, has schizophrenia or is schizophrenic or all that, that language gets murky, right. but meet the diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia, I think is a safe way to put it. Um, so if one is then adding to that number of people exhibiting or, and suffering from psychotic symptoms that prevent them from having uh, functional work lives, et cetera. That, that's, that's an issue. Um, how difficult is it for these adolescents and teens to quit 
vaping and e-cigarettes and cannabis? I mean, um, can they quit just by deciding? Are there programs? Are they all going into, um, you know, recovery programs? Are there recovery programs in schools? I mean, how successful are they in stopping? It's really difficult. And, and maybe I'll talk about nicotine first. And, and the same would be true for cannabis, but a little bit less extent. I mean, both are addictive. And, and interestingly, not a lot of people realize that cannabis is addictive. And about one in six teens or people who are using, particularly under the age of 25, do become addicted. So They don't realize that it's addictive. They don't realize it's addictive. The argument I often heard was it's not as bad as alcohol, which is a um, kind of a lame argument. I understand why people default to that, but I mean, getting hit by a car might not be as bad as getting hit by a train. Um, yeah. But yeah. I don't. I wouldn't even look at that analogy as accurate. They're yeah. just different um, levels of destructive, different types of destructive. Um, yeah, they, these not as bad as blank doesn't really seem to to work. No, no, and and. You know, I often say, people say, well, why'd you start studying tobacco? I mean, there is no safe level of tobacco use, period. Yes, we have very few 30-year-olds who suddenly pick up a cigarette and become addicted. You know, at that point, you, you, your development of your brain. Now, can, if you use regularly, are you still going to hurt your lungs and, and heart and stuff like that? Absolutely. The brain changes may not be there in the same way. But most people don't pick up a cigarette or an e-cigarette for the very first time in their 30s or 40s and, and on. So absolutely, it's addictive, and and it is probably the most difficult to quit uh, drug that's out there. Whereas alcohol, we don't see. I mean, yes, we have alcoholism. I'm not downplaying that. It's a huge issue in this country. It's a huge issue on this planet. But you're not going to have people in two weeks, three weeks suddenly say, I'm addicted to alcohol. You are going to with nicotine and you are with cannabis to some extent as well. So Yes, uh, nicotine is incredibly addictive, and we have so many teens who are addictive, addicted to nicotine through e-cigarettes and really struggling to get off of it. I gave a talk recently to a group of parents, and they said, this is all great information, Bonnie, but how do I help my kid? And I just felt awful because there's not a lot that we have. So taking a few different things. First of all, we don't have – there are some programs. There are inpatient programs, absolutely, showing some some Inpatient positive. programs. There are actually some inpatient programs. And but those are going to be expensive or require that people have insurance that will cover that. Absolutely. And they take weeks. And then you're taking a young person out of their natural environment, out of their school, out of their friends, stigmatizing, which – Hopefully we're not stigmatizing drug use anyway, but you know, you take a, a young person at 12, 14, 16, you put them in another place, that's very difficult on them. And if part of why they're using in the first place is stress, you're just enhancing that. Outpatient programs, we have some things, but the problem is we don't have the best recommendations because we don't have great research. So for example, nicotine replacement therapy, the patch. First of all, it's not authorized for use by the FDA. It's not been approved by the FDA for anybody under 18. And yet we have a lot of teenagers who are addicted. We just don't have the right studies, and they haven't gone to the FDA for that approval. Now, a lot of doctors are using nicotine patches and prescribing them for somebody under 18. It's considered off-label, but you still can do it, and most people would recommend it. The, the problem is, and, and I don't mean problem with using them. I have no problem with, and, and I've often suggested to, and I don't treat. I, I want to make sure that I'm not misquoted there either. I don't directly treat and see patients myself. But based on the evidence and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations, we should be using the, a patch with those under 18. But then the question is, how much? If a nicotine patch is about 21 milligrams of nicotine and a teenager is using 40 milligrams at a day. Do you give two patches? And I've had some doctors say, wow, that's a lot of nicotine. I say, well, they're using a lot of nicotine. What I've heard some uh, my adolescent medicine colleagues have suggested is one patch and then supplement with gums and suckers and lozenges. Not as a starting. I don't mean like what we're seeing with, with some uh, pouches out there like Zen as a starter. I don't mean that. I mean as a a form of treatment. As a way to wean them off? As so reducing to... the dosage over time? Correct. Correct. And and 
th- now, but then they also don't have the the hand to mouth piece that we see that is difficult. So gum, in this case, I mean non-nicotine gum, just chewing regular gum. Um, I've heard teenagers say that their that their withdrawal lasts three to four minutes. So they have a one teenager said I have a playlist on my phone that's each song is three to four minutes. And when I start to feel the withdrawal, I pop the music in my ears and I go do something and I listen to the song. And by then that uncomfortable feeling is over. I've heard teens say that they'll run, that there's many different things that they'll do. Um, Chewing on a toothpick, not a nicotine toothpick, but just a toothpick. Um, Other ways to really get their mind off of that feeling is really important. But we also have to know with adults and cigarettes, it can take 7 to 11 tries. So we can't expect, until they're fully off of a cigarette, we can't expect a teenager to quit overnight. Especially we, with the social pressure. And again, sorry to interrupt, but no, I think no, that no. the 7 to 11 tries, I um, did an episode on, on nicotine and I talked about smoking a bit and most people fail. Most people fail. They relapse. It's very, very difficult to quit smoking. People that do it and stick to it are real heroes of the process. Uh, it's not, not easy. Um, but... That's with a heavy incentive, you know, immediate health issues. Sometimes it's financial, um, et cetera. With kids, it feels like all, all the pressures are pushing in the opposite direction because it's socially yeah. rewarded. They get that, you know, elevation of mood and focus. And there's just oh so much um, driving them to, you know, continue using. Absolutely right. One of the things that we do in our program to help teens quit is we talk about social withdrawal. And it was actually one of our, we, we have a, a wonderful group of 40 youth who work with us. We call it our Youth Action Board, our YAB, our Reach Lab YAB. Uh, our YABs say that we need to talk about social withdrawal, not just physical, because of exactly what you're talking about. They may not be able to go to that party at uh, on a Saturday night where they know their friends are vaping because it'll, it, and we know the brain cues up that they'll see or smell or, or witness somebody using an e-cigarette and those cues will happen and they'll want to use it. So they actually have to isolate themselves from their friend group who was using. So it's very difficult. So really setting up your social milieu, really setting up your friends who are not using, really trying to talk uh, and, and have your family around you. And I really tell parents, it's not the time to get pissed off with your kids for using. It's the time to really help them. Let's be in this together. And often I say the reason why they're using is at their fault. Let's go back to the beginning of our conversation about marketing and and that they're being targeted. And teens didn't even know what was hitting them, what was going on. So let's not be mad at them. Let's be sympathetic and help. So they need the combination of nicotine replacement. They need to change their milieu. They need to have healthy snacks and water and, and exercise and all kinds of things around them. And they may also need cognitive behavioral therapy or some other therapy to really get them. It's not going to be a one-stop. We need to work with them. And that's the same with cannabis, by the way. This is just any drugs. And I just feel so bad. It is such a problem right now. When we built our curriculums, same thing I said. I was doing middle and high school and never thought I'd do elementary. And we have an elementary curriculum. I thought I was only going to do prevention. We now have inter- intervention and moving towards cessation. That's how many young people are just struggling right now. When I was in high school, there seemed to be a phenomenon of, you know, certain behaviors allowed kids to have some social clout um, by virtue of, I guess they used to call it holding, like if someone had weed or if somebody, um, yeah, if they had weed, then it sort of gave them a position in the social structure. Oftentimes the... um, Kids that, you know, I mean, I was friendly and knew most people in my high school class, um, you know, and a a few of them were kind of like less socially engaged than others. But then at some point midway through high school, one of them was like start showing up with weed at parties or something. And suddenly like they had like a social clout. Um, It was kind of interesting to see how, you know, having paraphernalia, having nicotine or cannabis or whatever it is, is sort of... um, I think has long been a kind of like an instant um, sort of uh, route to inserting oneself into a social structure, which is obviously unhealthy. I'm not I'm not promoting this. Yeah. But, and then it is social. 
right? That there's a there's sort of an instant substrate for communication. When I was growing up, I worked at a skateboard shop, and on my break, I would go behind the shop. There's a little alley there. We'd skateboard. There's this little bump, and but occasionally, like um, employees would share a, share a cigarette, or you'd, you'd ask someone for a cigarette. This this was kind of a way of bridging social gaps. Um, so again, I I feel like it's so hard to be a teenager. There's so much going on internally and externally. And everything you're talking about, you know, in terms of the, the negative health effects, the paraphernalia, the marketing, the taste, the addictive qualities of it, et cetera, um, just start to pile on all these these challenges to to staying away from it. But a big one seems to be the kind of instant um, social cred that one gets when they uh, participate in something that other people are participating in. Because, for, for instance, like a sport, like if there's a pickup basketball game, you, you have to play reasonably well to get into – get into the game. Otherwise, you're, it's not going to be easy or you have to be very bold, yeah. right? Um, so unless you're engaged in a sport, you're in theater, or you're doing other things, it, it's sort of an instant route. Okay. I think I've made my point. Yeah. Um, is there anything about that um, that by way of understanding, you know, can help, you know, create like replacement behaviors? I mean, it's going to be hard to take a kid who's you know, entire life is hanging out with their friends and vaping cannabis or nicotine after school and hanging around and playing on their phone and saying, hey, listen, you're going to quit vaping nicotine. You're going to feel worse. Your friends are all going to be doing it. And um, you'll still be their friend, but you're not really part of it. It's almost like you have to create a culture of quitting before this can really go the other direction. You do. And and what you're saying is is so correct and so relevant and why I feel so bad for teens right now. And, and, and the social media, right? You put, put that in there as well. And it's all over the place right now with them. They're bombarded by all of the different factors that you talked about. And it was interesting, we were talking about earlier around the social aspects too. I was thinking there was a point where it was so cool, particularly around Joel, it was so cool to Joel that I had teens come up to me and say, Dr. Bonnie, do you have a fake e-cigarette? And I said, a fake e-cigarette? Well, yeah, all my friends are using and I don't want to, but I want to fake it. And I just felt so bad. And I said, well, I'm not going to get you a fake e-cigarette, but I will help you with refusal skills and teach you how to say no, but in this case, not just say no, but teach you how to feel good about about saying no to certain things that you don't want to be doing. And during that time, there was it was very difficult for teens to come up and say, I either want to quit or I don't want to be a user. I just don't want to start because that was not cool. I think we've changed in the last couple of years, thankfully. I think there are more teens who are not using, who are open to it or who are open to quitting. A lot of teens want to quit right now. So thankfully, we're in a new era where, this, yes, the pressures to use are absolutely there, but there's starting to be a tide change where we're getting more teens who are getting on the so-called bandwagon to either quit or not use. I think the social supports are being there a lot more than we've ever seen before. We have more youth groups groups who are getting on board of either trying to help quit or trying to make sure that it's okay not to use. Um, it's still hard and what you're talking about. So it's our job as adults and healthcare providers and community partners and educators to really talk to young people to set up those social groups and say, it's okay not to use. It's okay to come on over to this group. And yeah, maybe you're not going to be with that same social group on Saturday night. Let's start a new social group for you. I'm not saying it's easy. This is not easy for young people. And it's not easy. Parents are struggling too. They're struggling to know what to, how to talk to their teenagers. But this is what we have to work towards and setting up those social networks of it's cool not to use. One of the other things, by the way, that we talk about is the environment. And when we talk to teens about not using and why, it, why it's bad for them, heart, lungs, et cetera, and all the things, and being duped and being marketed to, and, and the money. The environment piece has also been interesting. You know, teens right now may not care about their hearts, their lungs 20 years from now, but they care about the environment. And there are environmental aspects to these, the plastics, the, the pods don't disappear, the benzoic acid does not evaporate and and we've got secondhand vapor, secondhand smoke, secondhand and third hand. So what I mean by that is if I were to use an e-cigarette near you, you would actually get 
a lot of the vo volatile organic chemicals, a lot of the nicotine is in the air. Actually, some studies suggest COVID might even be in those droplets. There's a lot of issues there. And then third hand is it just doesn't dissipate. That vapor, aerosol, it's not a vapor, that aerosol then settles into carpets and, and clothes and so on. And this is toxic to pets, to children, things like that. So when we talk to teens about that, that's another way to get young people to be willing to either quit or to rally around not using is the environment. You know, it, it, if I wash dishes for too long, and my, my younger was out of the house, but when, when she comes over, I, I get yelled across the room, Mom, turn the water off, the environment, we have to save water. That's what they care about so much that if we could at least get that into young people's hands, say, you know what? You may not care about yourself, but what about your friends and what about the environment? I think we can also shift some of the generation right now. Interesting. Yeah, I think replacement behaviors, concern for the environment, seem like good incentives. And I'm hearing all this. I feel really lucky that I was always obsessed with something growing up, whether or not it was like birds and fish tanks or skateboarding or prior to that soccer or, you know, um, I mean, certainly there were drugs and alcohol around, but there was, there were always activities that kept us busy. Um, and I guess I wonder whether or not the advent of social media has created less interest in activities. I've had, you know, after school activities, I guess they used to call them. But, um, I mean, even if it's video games, um, if it's, playing a sport, if it's theater, if it's um, art, if it's music. Uh, presumably kids are still doing all that stuff. But is it the case that the kids that are vaping, let's say nicotine, maybe cannabis as well, are less likely to be engaged in other activities? I mean, is this thing becoming just kind of a closed loop of reward? I mean, that that's to me the real danger of any substance that um, increases the dopamine system activation without a lot of effort, right? Because as you and I know, the, the, the whole of dopamine circuitry as it le relates to reward is all about effort, reward, reinforcement, effort, re right. reward, reinforcement. Um, but the effort piece is key and drugs basically bypass the effort piece and then you get the reward reinforcement and then eventually the rewarding and reinforcing levels of, of return on that drug, nicotine, cannabis, et cetera, diminishes and then you're just caught in a behavioral loop. Right, right, right absolutely. Um, so, you know, are, are kids doing less stuff? Are they, are they studying less as a consequence of this? Are they, are they playing fewer sports? Are they less engaged in youth theater and music and youth groups and things like that? When we were talking about cigarettes, when I first started my career up until probably 2014, I would say, yes, you're absolutely correct. And it was generally the teens who would say, I'm bored and I didn't know what to do with myself. And that's why I picked up cigarettes or, um, or I'm not an athlete or, or this was my social outlet. I haven't seen that as a result as much with e-cigarettes. Now, as a result of e-cigarettes, yes, but not as a cause of using because it's so ubiquitous. E-cigarettes, we're seeing everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're, how old you are, male, female. It used to be more males using because some of the earlier devices were more tech and, and guys were using it and, and some of the females didn't want to put them in their purse because they would leak. We now are seeing more of an equal rate, if not a little bit more female using. Um, it's it's not your so-called bad or good kids. It's not anything. It's not the young people who are struggling with school. It's everywhere right now, independent of location, race, ethnicity, things like that. So I don't see so much what you're talking about in terms of a predictor, in terms of a, of a result. Absolutely. I mean, then we're seeing teens who become more isolated, who are not engaged as much, who are more bored because they're sitting home and they're vaping. Um, but I also see a lot of young people sitting around together vaping. Uh, so I, I do think that that landscape has changed. Um, is it going to change back? I don't know, as hopefully we change the culture again. Uh, but it, it, it's an interesting thought. I mean, as soon as you said that, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, they're certainly not out as much as they used to be in terms of, you know, we were talking about this at the beginning, we're not seeing them out in parks as much, we're not seeing them playing pickup 
sports games as much as we used to. But I don't think that's because of e-cigarette use. I think that's because of social media and just the whole change. And honestly, parents being afraid of letting their kids out for some predatory behavior and in other ways. Um, and, you mean if uh, kids are let out of the house, they're more at risk? to predatory behavior, but of course they're also at risk when, but just by use of the phone because the phone connects everywhere. Absolutely, the yeah. phone connects everywhere, and that's something we try to teach teens as well. But I think that that's been something that parents are worried about. You know, I have to you know, almost the pendulum almost swung too much of now I have to keep my kid in because I don't want to let them out of the house and I don't want to let them alone driving and alone at the park and things like that. But I think that we've reduced. You were talking earlier about autonomy. We've reduced teens just autonomy and they they have to get into a little bit of trouble. They have to jaywalk. They have to do, I mean, I'm not encouraging, but, you know, but, no. but we, th there's some natural amount of getting together and hanging out and being crazy at the park and playing and playing games and things like that. And I think that has stopped or, or slowed down a lot. Uh, I, I see it with, with some people in my own community. I don't see as much just hanging out in the front yard and shooting the breeze and instead they're they're inside and they're on their phones and, and and stuff like that so could that be part of why we're seeing more e-cigarette use possibly i just don't have i haven't seen the studies on it you know perhaps that's a good segue into risky behaviors when i was a kid i mean the dumb stuff that we did <laughs> um meaning dumb because it was dangerous to ourselves I mean, I am not suggesting people do this. Kids, please don't do this. Just don't. But just the dumb stuff of, you know, jumping off roofs or between roofs. Um, I'm not going to give any other uh, any anecdotes. Just uh, it's amazing that we all survived. Um, and, and some didn't. But that was largely the consequence of drugs, alcohol, mental health issues of kids I knew. Um, but car accidents. Um, Actually, I grew up in the uh, in the Mothers Against Drunk Driving yeah. era, and there was a there was real discouragement of, around drunk driving. I was fortunate that at least in high school, m most of my friends didn't drink or didn't drink much. Um, but you still heard about fatalities in kids happen. Um, even one is is too many, obviously. Um, what's going on now in terms of risk taking behavior? Um, driving fast, driving drunk. Um, doing what used to be just described as dumb stuff um, that unfortunately sometimes is is fatal or you know results in paralysis people jumping off bridges into water without testing the water depth you know we've all heard the stories and sadly um, they're true stories of people becoming paralyzed that kind of thing dumb stuff dangerous stuff teens do more of it um, is it still true that Males are doing more of that physical danger stuff than than um, than females, or is that not true? That, that's what we used to hear, but then of course there's been this big push, importantly, really to um, balance out the amount of research on on uh, right. both sexes. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, some of it has to do with just the methods of our research to know. You know, it's interesting. I haven't seen more recent data in terms of differences by sex of, of risk engagement and risk behavior. I mean, a lot of what I've seen is balanced out. I think it's maybe different kinds of risk behaviors that, that people do. But we're still seeing it. I, we're still seeing teens drinking. We're still seeing teens going to parties and getting drunk. We're still seeing teens out on the beach and getting drunk. I think the big difference now is whether it's from Mothers Against Now. I think it's destructive driving. Is that what it's called? I think it's now Mothers destructive Against... Destructive driving. I think that's oh, so what So that includes is. drunk driving and racing. And racing yeah. and, and driving under the influence of cannabis or anything right. else, which right. can be harmful. But... At least in, in a lot of the teens and young adults I've talked to, at least we've gotten that word out to teens. So they're still drinking, and they're still doing stupid stuff when they drink, but they're not getting behind the wheel as much, um, much less. And this idea of a designated driver or sober driver. Um, Uber. Or Uber. Uber's really changed. Or Lyft, changed. I guess we should Or Lyft fair. or any well, ride well, share, right, let's just say share. any ride yeah. share, has certainly been uh, a, a game changer. It, in, in the landscape of teenagers and young adults right now. Uh, and, and in fact, I've heard not just a designated driver, but a designated 
partner or a sober a sober sitter. So this idea that you go to a party and there may be drinking going on, but you make sure that there's one person who's sober, not just for driving, but to make sure you're not going home with somebody you don't want to go home with, to make sure that you're not leaving drunk and falling downstairs, to make sure that you're not falling out of that window. So that message we've gotten across really well, which I'm thrilled about. Are we still seeing drunk driving in accidents? I certainly have among some people I know. Certainly we are. But I think that the message overall has gotten out there. Some people I've talked to said we just just don't get behind the wheel, period. What's also interesting is more and more teens are not driving. They're delaying driving more and more, whether that's because of Uber Lyft. I mean, it's, it's as a parent, it's less expensive to pay for a ride share than to pay for insurance for somebody under 25 or to pay for a car. So certainly that might be it. Um, but, but that is there. Doing other stupid stuff, I mean, in addition to drugs, jumping, skateboarding, certainly we're still seeing that. Well, skateboarding is a good sport. You got to <laughs> don't exceed your skill level, but jumping between buildings, yes. not smart. Yeah. Um, unless you're super skilled and know what you're doing. I mean, you know, there right. are the parkour kids and the skateboard kids and the, and the BMX because we, we don't want to take away no, uh, no, what, no, what no, the no. incredible Absolutely. things that they can, can do, but but there's risk there, right? right? right. I, I was referring to people who lack the skill to to complete the to complete the maneuver right. and um, right. and getting badly hurt or or in yeah. some cases not getting badly hurt, but you, you just kind of shake your head and wonder why you, why you ever engaged in that kind of stuff. Right. Just so risky. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We're definitely still seeing risk behavior amongst teenagers. And part of it has to do with impulsivity. We know that teens up until around uh, part of the development, right, of cognitive and social, psychosocial and social development is up until around 16, 17. They're still very impulsive. Uh, we know with the brain development, right, the back of the brain develops fa faster and first. And that's our amygdala, our emotional center, our motor coordination versus the front of the brain, which is our executive functioning, our uh, uh, planning for the future, our really slowing down and being able to think of the risks and benefits and make those decisions a little slower and a little bit better, more like we would as adults. So we certainly see impulsive decision, you know, hey, let's go TP that house or let's go ride on that car or let's go do things that probably hopefully wouldn't get them killed or injured, but may get them busted in other ways. We're still seeing that. I think there have been more programs to help teens sort of rehearse in, in situations so they're not, they're more life skills training so they're not making some of those impulsive decisions. But teens will. Teens are going to be teens, which, by the way, is why we don't put things in front of them like you know, sugar booger and unicorn kind of marketing that's going to get teens attractive because that is buying into that knee jerk, impulsive, it looks cool, everyone's doing a kind of thing that they can resist. I don't mean that they can't, but just buys right into teens are going to be teens and that's what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, what about sexual behavior? You mentioned that kids are driving less, um, or getting their driver's license less frequently. Um, which, by the way, with respect to teens wanting to drive less, that just like baffles my mind. I mean, one of the reasons I like skateboarding as a sport is you could do it anywhere. It was also transportation, and I liked the social milieu. I loved the social milieu of it. Um, and But getting my driver's license was like one of the most important events of my life. Me too. I mean, Me I, too. I could drive yeah. to Yosemite in the summer. I could do all sorts of things with that. I'm so surprised that kids wouldn't want to do that. Um, such autonomy there, so much fun. Um, oh, I, but, I agree. But I've also heard that um, rates of, of sexual behavior are going down. Is that true? Yeah, stabilizing and going down. Um, and certainly rates of risky sexual behavior has also gone down. So we are getting the message across around condom use, around um, STI testing, around birth control, things like that, which is also really good. But rates overall have gone down. Is teen pregnancy down? I think it's down. Actually, I haven't looked at the latest numbers. I think it's down. Uh, certainly, I don't think it's gone up. But I'm, I actually would need to look back at those numbers. It's been a little while since I've looked at them. And is what we're talking about um, today mostly within the United States and the United States alone, or does it carry over to other countries as well? So it, it totally depends on the behavior that we're talking about. Let's I mean, say vaping um, or e-cig use of cannabis at, uh, or nicotine. 
So interestingly, e-cigarette, nicotine uh, e-cigarette use has not been as high in a lot of other countries. It depends on the country. But for example, the UK or Europe, we haven't seen the rates as high in the last few years. Part of it was that a lot of other states have a nicotine standard. So that means a minimum amount or maximum amount, excuse me, of nicotine that you're allowed to have. So for example, the UK, I think it's around 1.7%. In the US, we have no nicotine standard, which is another major issue with regulation. We don't have, I mean, we have, as I was saying, 5%, 10% nicotine levels. There is no regulation about how much nicotine that you could have. So in certain countries, if it's right around the addictive level or a little bit below it, we're going to see fewer teens becoming addictive. It's still bad at any amount, but we're going to see fewer people becoming addictive. The other is the marketing was not as big in other countries and really was the marketing was e-cigarettes if you're trying to stop smoking cigarettes, not marketed to teens. That has changed in the last year or two. So in countries I've talked to, for example, the UK, I've been interviewed by them many times in the last few years, and they would say, we don't have the same problem. And now they're saying, boy, we are seeing a pretty significant increase in the number of teens who are using Part of it is a different landscape of the kind of e-cigarette that's out there, the kind of marketing that's out there, whatever it is, we are now seeing, is it as high as we have in the U.S.? I don't think so, but it's certainly increasing. Same thing in in other countries where they actually didn't allow certain e-cigarettes to be on the market have now come in and and been on the market and infiltrated. And even in this country, certain e-cigarettes are illegal, and they're coming in um, illegally through illicit trading is happening and, and, and crossing the borders. So, um, so e-cigarette, we're still seeing. Cannabis depends on, this, on the country, right, whether it's legal or not. Now, even in the U.S., I should say, even states that have legalized cannabis – you have to be 21, uh, but we're still seeing underage cannabis use, of course, just like we're seeing underage drinking and underage nicotine use. In st- other states where it's just really difficult to get, we're not seeing cannabis as much, but we still are seeing it. We didn't talk about um, things like Zin pouches, mm-hmm. which are becoming more popular with adults as well. So no vaping, no e-cig, no smoking nicotine, but a little pouch. Um, which is different than dipping tobacco or snuffing tobacco. Um, As far as I know, uh, Zin pouches and things similar deliver nicotine into the bloodstream, which then crosses the blood-brain barrier, goes into the brain, has this effect of creating focus and alertness, kind of a little high, Um, but doesn't carry the same carcinogenic risk. But presumably there are other risks. which include, of course, the addictive and habit-forming nature of it, the blood pressure increase, the vasoconstriction, which is related to the blood pressure, et cetera. But what do we know about Zin pouch use? Is it on the rise? Or, um, is, or is it that there's something so compelling about vaping and um, e-cigs that you know, people, in particular kids, want the, the physical act of, of vaping? So um, this is a case where we, I've seen this one other time where actually the popular press is – ahead of the scientific press and probably er, ahead of the science and teaching us scientists that we better hurry up and figure this out. How is, how is that? Uh, um, so the popular press has been talking about Zin a lot and, and arguing that it's a very popular product and that we're seeing, now this is true, we're seeing a very sharp increase in the market share of Zin compared to other nicotine products. So we're seeing it on the rise. What I mean by science hasn't caught up is we don't have a lot of surveillance data to show whether or not teens are actually using Zin. We have some data. We actually published a study a couple years ago showing around 20 to 25% of people in general, adolescents and adults, and about 11 to 15% of teens are using a pouch, presumably Zin. We didn't ask. We now are looking at our data around Zin use. Um, But we don't have wide-scale studies. We do have studies of pouches more generally, like the CDC showed that about, I think it was a couple of percent, one and a half percent, and that it went up a little bit. So I think, I can't remember, it was something like, I think it went from one per, 1.1% to about 1.5% of teens seem to be admitting using pouches. So not a huge increase, but a few hundred thousand teens are using across the country, as opposed to two and a half million plus using e-cigarettes. 
But with all those qualifications aside, yes, we are seeing an increase in Zen use amongst teenagers. What's most concerning is that it seems like it's teenagers who are not using it in addition to e-cigarettes, but new initiates. So they're now, just like I'm concerned about teens initiating tobacco or nicotine through e-cigarettes, now it seems like some are initiating through Zen. So Zen is kind of the gateway. It may be an on-ramp um, to using and, and And the idea is that they're putting it in between their lip and their gum, and then each pouch of Zin is three or six milligrams. It comes in mm-hmm. a three milligram pouch or a six milligram pouch. Now it is nicotine that yes, it's originally de- derived from tobacco, but there's no tobacco in the pouch itself. It's a white powdered nicotine. And the I don't know what else is in there. We are really lacking the research there. But my concern is we've seen this with smokeless tobacco for years is oral cancer. And you're putting this in the mouth and at the mucosal line. And are we going to start being concerned about oral cancer, which we've already been concerned about with other pouches? How would you get oral cancer if, there, if there's no tobacco and it's just nicotine? Does nicotine? I, I was under the impression, and please tell me if I'm wrong, that nicotine itself doesn't cause cancer. The question is, what else is in there? Is it just nicotine right. or is there aldehydes and other chemicals that are cut with it? So that's why I'm saying we don't sure. know enough about it. Yeah. My big concern is exactly what you're saying. Are we going to start seeing teens using nicotine and then nicotine pouches and moving on? But the, the brain piece, it doesn't matter what else is in there. We are still concerned about the brain development. And if you're using a three milligram or a six milligram pouch, and we know that a lot of teens are using multiple pouches, our study showed this as well, multiple pouches throughout the day, and actually some social media is showing teens putting in several pouches at the same time, then you might be getting, again, as much as a pack of cigarettes of nicotine, and that's very concerning. So the whole piece we talked about before about brain development and are we stunting or changing or or really rewiring the brain with nicotine, doesn't matter what form it's in, it is not good, and it's not good for teenagers. Yeah, I uh, get asked a lot of questions about Zin pouches and other nicotine pouches, and one of the more common questions is um, related to the fact that a lot of people start with one or two pouches a day, quickly move to four to five, and the typical ceiling for most people that at least ask me questions uh, about it uh, is moving to quickly a canister a day. Yeah. which is a lot of pouches. Uh, I think it's 15 to 20 pouches per can. Okay, so three to six milligrams. Right. You can do so the math. Do the math. What's that? 60 to upwards of 60 right. milligrams. That's that's. And I'm thinking back three to- Three packs of cigarettes. Oh, you got your step yeah. ahead of me. Two yeah. steps ahead of me. Yeah. Uh, two. Let, uh, let's play it safe. Two. I'll give you- you know, Two packs of cigarettes per at day. At least two packs of cigarettes worth of nicotine. And it's interesting in, in, the, in the old days when we didn't have e-cigarettes and we were talking about cigarettes and we were talking about adults, we would talk pack cigarette years, right? How many packs of cigarettes and for how many years? And that language kind of reduced for a while because adults and people weren't using cigarettes as much. And so we weren't worrying about this concept of packs. I'm worried about it again. We're getting so much nicotine now. Now, yes, not in the form of combusted, not in the form of burning. Maybe it's in the form of e-cigarettes or pouches. But it's still a huge amount of nicotine that we're seeing that young, very young brains are using. Yeah, can't be good, in my opinion. I spent years studying brain development, still teach brain development every year. Can't be good. The brain doesn't do well developing with high, artificially high levels of any neuromodulator. And then you go back to the eight-year-olds we were talking about earlier, and we have no studies, right, on what does a drug like nicotine do to not a teen brain, but a child brain. And clearly is not good. But what exactly is happening, we don't have those studies, but it's it's incredibly scary to, to think about what's happening with young people um, and getting addicted so young and then continuing that addiction of a lifetime of addiction that they might have. Seems like it would be appropriate now to kind of take a step back. Um, I think everyone agrees that, that, that these are major problems that are in our youth. Um, and just evaluate messaging and tools to overcome uh, these issues. 
Um, right. So obviously, if you never try a substance or a behavior, you can't get addicted to it. Um, but given the prevalence of this stuff, what sorts of messaging work? Earlier, we talked about said, you know, accessing the, the rebellious spirit that is youth as a way to get um, youth to engage in healthier behaviors and abandon unhealthy behaviors. But there's quitting. There's just saying no. And then there's harm reduction. Um, there's convincing people that some substance is bad for them and scaring them to the point where they quit. There's incentivizing them to be healthy. There's um, replacement behaviors. There's just so much in that landscape. I know you just um, held a conference on cannabis and tobacco recently. I'm sorry I wasn't able to attend. It sounds super interesting. But whether or not we're talking about social media or cannabis or risky driving behavior or um, you know reckless behavior of any kind, I mean, what works? And when I say this, I don't necessarily just mean at the level of public health discourse, but also parent to child, um, peer to peer, yeah. um, sibling to sibling. What works? I mean, how should one approach a kid or an adult for that matter who's vaping cannabis or is vaping nicotine at, uh, and it's just clearly going to be a bad trajectory? What can one do? I mean, we all also understand personal accountability and neuroplasticity generally emerges best when it comes from within as opposed from the outside. But w what can we do? The most important is, and I've said this for years, have a conversation. And some people think that having a conversation about name your name your risk behavior, drugs uh, of any sort, alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, having a conversation about sex, having a conversation about risky driving, get young people curious. That is not at all the case. There's nothing we can talk to a young person about that they don't already know. You know, we're kidding ourselves to say, oh, we can't mention drugs to a 16-year-old because we're going to get them curious. They've known about drugs since they were eight years old. We're not. And, and I often say to parents, start that conversation young. When, you're, when your kids are really young, four or five, maybe the conversation is having a cookie or having some grapes and, and make, or going to bed now or going to bed in five minutes. I used to say that with my own kids. You want to go to bed now or in five minutes? So they felt like they were making the decision. I didn't really care which decision they were making. It was not a fight. We need to start having conversations around decision making and healthy decision making and not have a, a confrontation, but a conversation very young. Now, I'm not saying that we talk about drugs or sex when they're very young, although to be honest, I did. I talked about cigarettes and, and, um, and pubertal development with my kids when they were very young. But, it, but just starting that conversation so that when you move into more sensitive topics, more difficult topics, as a child ages and becomes an older child and, and into a, a adolescence, it's not shocking that you're having those conversations. And this is whether you're a parent, a, an educator, or whatever. So just talking, a conversation, and not scheduling it, by the way, not on Saturday at three o'clock, we're going to sit down and talk about sex, or at three o'clock, we're going to talk about drugs. That does not work. You need to, I, I would joke that I was like the queen of organic conversation. You know, I'd see something on TV. Oh, you know, oh, let's have a conversation about that. Just making it a natural part. And you were asking about differences in cultures and, and countries. We don't normalize those conversations. Other countries do, and we need to be doing that. So well, it sounds like thing. we don't normalize them or formalize them. Correct. Mm -hmm. We don't. So that's one thing. The other is we're kidding ourselves if we just talk about the just say no, as we were saying before. Of course we want no use. Of course we want teens to wait. I mean, I often say we hope and expect that most people, if not all, will grow up into a healthy sexual relationship, whatever that might look like. Even a healthy alcohol relationship, a glass of wine or half a glass of wine at night with dinner. Again, no safe use of a lot of the other drugs, including nicotine, certainly fentanyl, illicit fentanyl. I want to make clear, not all fentanyl, but illicit fentanyl. But to just simply say no and don't do and it's bad for you is setting up, again, that failure of your conversation because, okay, well, you're telling me it's bad, but I liked it or my friend liked it and it's not so bad. So you've lost credibility. The most important part of harm reduction is not to do it. 
Absolutely, of course. Not to use, not to have risky sex, maybe not to have sex at all until you're older, not to use tobacco, not to use any drugs. But how do we do that with a young person who you go into a classroom and 10%, 20% have already started using or having sex or whatever the conversation is, you shut them down. Well, they don't understand me, so why should I listen to them? They're not talking to me. And so that no use conversation doesn't work. There's a continuum or a spectrum of use, everything from no use to once in a while to regular use all the way up to addicted use. We're talking about drugs. So to go in and assume that nobody's ever used or nobody wants to use, you're setting yourself up for failure. That's the expectation. That's the hope. But what we really also need to talk about is best if you don't use but if you do, let's, if you are using, let's help you cut back or quit. And if you are continuing to use, let's keep you safe. Let's make sure that you're not going to die. And what I'm talking about here is, you know, when, when most parents, if their kids are going to go to a party, well, I shouldn't say most parents, but a, a conversation often is, hey, I hope you're not drinking. But if you are, pick up the phone and I will come get you. That's harm reduction. And parents, oh, I didn't think about that. Well, that's putting safety first. That is a harm reduction message. Or or saying, you know, you're pretty young to start having sex, but here's a condom just in case. Why do we schools have condoms? And because they know that as much as we say it's best to delay, teens are going to. That's harm reduction. Let's at least reduce risk of STIs, pregnancy, and so on. And what do the data say is um, the consequence of harm reduction versus the um, kind of like thick black line, don't don't go anywhere near this behavior? All the research or pretty much all the research that I've read and hopefully will contribute to shows that those messages, the harm reduction messages, um, or what I would say comprehensive, really, uh, the harm reduction, unfortunately, harm reduction has gotten a bad rap, um, partly because of cigarettes versus e-cigarettes and this reduction or harm continuum with tobacco. So maybe we don't say harm reduction, we say comprehensive conversations, comprehensive education from no use all the way up to what do we do if you are using. And all the research is really saying that those messages are way more effective than not using at all than that. If we tell teens don't use, and we see this a lot in sexual behavior, we say, do not have sex, period. Sign a contract that you're not going to have sex. And then they're in a situation, and we don't arm them with the understanding of how to negotiate, how to have a a healthy relationship, how to have a conversation. What do they do if they're thinking that they might want to have sex? What do they do in that situation? We then find that we're having teens who then don't know how to protect themselves and either have sex that was unwanted or sex that was unprotected. And teens want to understand. They want the truth. They want the knowledge. I I went to a school and asked whether if I came and talked about cannabis, would they come? And they said, absolutely. I want to understand it. And there's this great quote that I recently learned um, that said, it, you know, if you don't, basically the concept is if you don't teach teens, they're going to f- seek out information. So the quote is, having teens learn about sex from porn is like having them learn physics from a transformer, from the transformers, or having them learn how to drive from Fast and Furious. We need to give teens the information because they're going to find it. That's right. They're being exposed to other information elsewhere um, anyway. So, there, so what you're talking about here is um, coming up with counterbalances. Counterbalances, real science-based information that's not overblowing the risks, that's not scaring them, and then that helps them understand it's best to say no, but if you do, fentanyl, let's make sure you're not using alone. I mean, obviously, I don't want somebody using a drug that hasn't been tested and they got off the, the internet period because I know kids who have died. Yeah, it's so scary, I, you know. <laughs> We have close friends that, um, gosh, I I would have never guessed that their kids were using drugs. And maybe they were using drugs at the frequency that was always typical of of youth. I don't know. I don't know the situations well enough. But, you know, I would say about once every four, sadly, once every um, four to eight months, I hear about someone's kid or close relative that died of a fentanyl overdose. Yeah. And it does seem to be kids um, maybe 30 and younger. 
Yeah, it was more in the, the 20s and 30s. It's now really getting into the teens and young adults. You're absolutely right. And some of the teens I know of who and, and young adults who have died were not your drug users. You know, we talked about not stigmatizing. And, and that's the other thing. If we don't talk, then we're stigmatizing. We need to have those conversations. But a lot of those teens were not using. They, they needed a pill because they were in pain or they needed something. And they were not told. And this is, again, that harm reduction and that conversation. They were not told, don't buy something off of the Internet if you do test it. And, and and test it with a fentanyl strip, for example, and make sure that you're not using a loan because if you're using a loan, we can't then give you Narcan. We can't do something. I carry Narcan with me all the time. Do you really? I do. I have it in my backpack all the time. For anyone that you might see that's having an overdose or anyone kid, who might see thankfully, kids in particular. Yeah. Thankfully it hasn't happened, but if, if it does, I would, and, and you can't hurt somebody from using it if that's not what's happening. So Use should it. everyone carry a Narcan? I think pen? everybody should have Narcan. I, I do. Wow. I think I think every school should have Narcan. I think every library should have Narcan. I think every bar should have Narcan. Um, I, I absolutely believe it. Now, test strips is an interesting debate that I've had. So I totally believe in this concept of comprehensive, if you don't want to say her reduction, comprehensive drug education, comprehensive sex education. And what I mean by that is both the spectrum of, of use or behavior, as well as all kinds of drug, sex, rock and roll, that we talk about the whole thing. But fentanyl test strips has been an interesting dilemma within myself, and I'll explain why. I've been working with some groups to try to test whether we could study whether if we put f both Narcan and fentanyl test strips in schools, would teens you get them? So your my fantasy, bowl of condoms, bowl of Narcan, bowl of fentanyl test strips, and you have it out for, for teens. Wow, that's, that's a bold statement. It is a very bold statement. What about the argument that I imagine some people uh, counter with? Um, I'm not necessarily saying this is my argument, but just um, imagining that some people will hear that and say, um, having those things uh, visible, freely available, will in will create more of an incentive for risk taking. So I've grappled with that. And with condoms, we know that that's not the case. It's not going to create teens starting to have sex. Just going back to what we said a few minutes ago, you're not going to incentivize or create people engaging in any risk behavior by having the conversation. But my grappling with the Narcan and with the fentanyl test strips has been there. Oh, well, you tell me it's a bad idea to use a drug, but I'll just test it and make sure it's okay. Well, I have a couple of problems with that. Um, even though I still believe in it, I still believe in having those there because right now we have an overdose epidemic with fentanyl and other drugs. So I'll be honest with you. I grapple. If 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 I were in a school and I saw a teenager taking a fentanyl test strip, which probably means that they're going to use it for themselves, is the first thing I want to do, shake the kid and say, are you crazy? Don't. That means that you're thinking about using drugs. Of course, that's my inclination as a parent, as a scientist, as a developmental psychologist, as a human being. You want to say, what are you doing? So yes, I would grapple. But at the same time, if I know that there's a chance that a teen's going to go to a party or pick up a drug and not know, do I? would I rather that they're safe? Yes. The problem with fentanyl test strips, though, is that they're not perfect. If you are testing the right side of the pill, but it's the left side that has fentanyl, you still could die. And so I don't want to give the impression that that there's a one stop is going to fix anything right now. It is not. And that that is the, the issue with the comprehensive drug education or harm reduction uh, conversations. I'm not saying that it's perfect. I'm not saying that it's going to stop young people from engaging or young people from, from getting hurt or, or you know, uh, unfortunately dying. But if you have a group of youth who are going to use, I would still rather arm them with that information so they don't find themselves in trouble, um, that is the biggest part that scares me. Is fentanyl making its way into all pharmaceuticals, so like benzos, um, MDMA? I'm thinking about some of the things that are taken recreationally, um, benzos, MDMA. Um, is it in cannabis? So most of what I've seen is either by itself fentanyl um, using or that it's mixed into pain 
pain um, pills a lot. Um, Why would kids want to take pain pills? I mean, they're I, in pain. They're stressed. I see. They're, they're, or, or, so they're doing they're doing it sort of self directed clinical. Correct. Or Prozac. They're anxious. I see. So it's not like they're doing it for recreational drug use at parties. Some are. Some aren't. Okay. I mean, there's been so many different circumstances. Um, cannabis and vaping have been interesting debates, and we actually had this just the other day. Uh, some of the studies suggest and the, uh, that and, and suggest that biologically we can't necessarily combine cannabis or nicotine and fentanyl and have the same reaction on the body, and some s- suggesting that the studies haven't been there. But I and it's still so new, but I will tell you that they're that talking to teens and some some studies suggesting that yes, teens are combining or at least getting. And a lot of times it's not knowingly. It's cut. The fentanyl is cutting, or the the uh, drug manufacturers and sellers are cutting a drug with fentanyl, and so they're not even teens are knowing it. But that some um, I was talking to a. a person the other day who said that he has definitely heard of and seen some teens with fentanyl overdoses from cannabis or from vaping. So there's so much studies that are still needed right now and to understand the biological mechanism um, as well as the the access to these drugs that we don't know. But I, I'm nervous. So we teach about drug testing. We teach about not getting something off. There used to be a uh, Skittle drug uh, parties, you'd go and people would take drugs and all different things and put them in the in the middle of a bowl in the middle of the room and just you take whatever. Whoa. Oh, yeah. When was that? No, this is not long ago. Maybe five, ten years ago I was hearing about these I never went parties. to a party like that. I didn't either, but I didn't go to many parties. I was, I was a yeah, pretty square kid. But, yeah, dr- it's yeah. interesting. Maybe, maybe it was just where it was. I mean, there were certainly drugs around, but um, I feel like now – Recreational pharmacology, it sounds like it's everywhere. And so it's so, so different. So, yeah. And self medication is is everywhere. Yeah, that wasn't um, that wasn't common. That wasn't as common. But least, we also Or if it was, people weren't talking about it. I think it was. I mean, I remember as a middle school student walking into the bathroom and somebody had taken, a, I think it was called a lewd then and, and had passed out. Um, it, it was certainly around uh, different drugs, uh, but not the not the same that we're seeing now. And we definitely saw cocaine overdoses when I was younger. Yeah, I, I feel like there was a lot of weed, cannabis, that is, um, alcohol, um, psilocybin then as a recreational drug now obviously it's being explored as a clinical tool yes. as is cannabis for that yeah. matter um but hard drugs like cocaine amphetamine were di- pcp were discussed in the media a lot but and it certainly existed in some high schools and colleges and things like that but it sounds like it's seeping out of everywhere um it is. and it's in these commercial products i mean i think the picture that um has been created here is kind of a, an ominous one so how optimistic are you? I will tell you I'm optimistic in seeing a, a change in the landscape of education. Now, some people say education doesn't work, that we need, need policies. We need both. I mean, we, we have federal policies and regulations that are slipping through the cracks. Uh, our FDA with regulation of e-cigarettes, with cannabis uh, legalization but not being enforced. We have uh, age restrictions not being enforced. So we certainly need education. And I'm seeing more and more people, for example, the concept of, of harm reduction or comprehensive education, comprehensive sex ed. Not everybody is, of course, up for it but or open to it, but I'm seeing more of a shift towards understanding the need. I'm definitely seeing more teens, as we were talking about earlier, more teens being willing to say, no, that's not something I'm going to do. More teens joining youth groups, more teens t- speaking out about concerns and, and trying to be healthier and make healthier decisions for themselves. So I'm optimistic in the, in the human capital and the social capital. I'm not optimistic when it comes to the, the pharmacology or, or the drug capital, so to speak. Um, more and more drugs infiltrating infiltrating our youth. I mean, you could vape dot, dot, dot anything nowadays, and that makes me very nervous. I do think vaping, um, and I am using vaping instead of e-cigarettes there to be more lay conversations there or, or what the, the, the culture is saying, vaping is just more normalized than, it, than we've ever had it, just like smoking was normalized. Vaping and now vaping anything is very scary to me and very much normalized. So that worries me. Again, the fentanyl, the hallucinogens. 
um, making its way more and more. So the, the drugs themselves and the new devices scares me. The social and the human capital gives me optimism. Very grateful to hear that you have optimism. Sounds to me, and correct me where I'm wrong, please, um, and add anything, that for parents, for siblings, for teachers, for educators, or for any concerned citizen, it seems like having conversations about these things, the fact that they're happening, so not turning a blind eye, the fact that, uh, you know, kids are aware of it, they're, you know, that we're fooling ourselves if we think that they aren't aware of these risk-taking behaviors. They're, they're sort of, they're all around them uh, anyway, so we shouldn't shy away from those conversations. And that at least having a conversation about the difference between avoiding behaviors and harm reduction is something that one ought to consider. I mean, obviously, this is a household-by-household household choice. Absolutely. Um, in some cases, school-by-school school or classroom-by-classroom classroom choice, but certainly household, maybe even parent-by-parent parent choice. But that... Um, because of social media and just because of the nature of youth that young people are having these conversations anyway. That, that's what I'm hearing coming through. And that, and that it, you said don't formalize the conversation so much that, you know, Saturday at 3 o'clock we're going to have a discussion about drugs, but make it part of the landscape to create some ease. Um, Absolutely. Make it facile to talk about these things, concerns, um, and probably listen to them too. They're right there in the midst of it. Um, so they have a data set internally about what what's actually happening. Totally agree. Totally agree. And and I often say to to parents or educators if you're they're listening to this podcast or anything, it, it's actually say, hey, I I learned something. Can we have a conversation about what I learned, and not confront. Again, that con it's a conversation, not a confrontation. It's let's normalize drug discussions. Let's normalize uh, behavior discussions, not normalize the use or the behavior itself. So talk to your teens. You're absolutely right. Talk to your teens. This is what I just learned. What do you know? Can we find out some information together? Go on our Reach Lab websites. Go on other web uh, websites. Go learn information out there. Learn together and not lecture, but have a conversation. You may not know right away. A teen may not tell you right away, yes, I'm using or yes, I'm having sex or yes, I'm drinking alcohol or yes, I'm doing something that is just an, a risky behavior. But that's not necessarily our goal as, as adults to find out today whether or not somebody is doing something. It's okay to let it be a little bit more organic. It's, a, it's okay to start that conversation and see that you're building trust. It is parent to parent. But I would say I'm not going to bust you. I, I certainly am not going to be happy. But let's have a conversation so that way we can build the trust and I can help you either not use, get help, stop using, or be safer in using, or help you prevent from using at all. So having that conversation, that organic... And, and talking to teens where they're at, as a developmentalist, that's what we do. Meet people where they're at, meet youth where they're at, whether that's using already, not using. Don't come at them with your preconceived notions as an adult because it will not work. It will backfire. We need to use the strengths. Young people are strong. Young people are smart. We need to use their strengths, take their lead, and then use our adult wisdom and experiences to then turn that into the proper conversation. Love it. Well, on the topic of conversation and communication, one of the um, kind of unique features of this podcast is that we have a, uh, a large social media um, footprint. Um, and inside of that footprint, we not only broadcast information, but we get information back. So in anticipation of uh, this conversation today, I reached out to uh, followers of Huberman Lab social media on X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram, and they had a lot of questions for you. We don't have time to go into the many thousands of questions, but I'm going to just ask you, um, if I may, in kind of a um, short Q&A format, a, a few of them, and if you don't have answers, you can just say pass, or we'll get back to that. <laughs> Maybe we'll do another uh, episode another time. Uh, please don't feel um, obligated to give thorough answers. This is, uh, we just wouldn't have time. Yeah, so one of the top questions is, would love to learn more about how to get teens to see the longer term implications of the choices they make and the habits they form now. Is there any way to get them to understand how now leads to later? <laughs> we've done studies where we've asked teens about their goals 
and I want to be a dancer. We had one team tell us, or I want to be a doctor, or I want to be whatever it is. Asking teens about their goals, about their aspirations, and then connecting their current behavior and their current risks and, and keeping themselves healthy and how that plays into their goals. That tends to work a lot, and we've seen that in our studies. Teens set boundaries. I don't want to get pregnant because I want to be a dancer, things like that. So really linking what they're doing now to their ultimate goals is one way to really help them think that through. Mm-hmm. I like that, how a, a different, maybe even larger goal um, maybe could supersede these like, like short-term behaviors, and um, they could see how those things link up. Absolutely. That, that's great. Um, there's another question that came in requesting some positive news about teenagers to be shared. Quote, every discussion is around risk or emotional distress or social anxiety or phone addiction, as if they're all dysfunctional uh, because of their brains. We never dismiss toddlers learning to talk and walk because their brains are offline. So I think the point is that, um, you know, can we highlight some of the ways in which the adolescent slash teen brain is um, – is exceptional at something that perhaps the rest of uh, the brains out there are not. So I mentioned some of them around our youth group and about the youth movement now uh, against drugs and and other things. I think, and it comes to the optimism, I'm the biggest teen advocate out there. It's why I study adolescents and I do the prevention and advocacy work that I do. Teenagers are fundamentally fantastic. Uh, They're creative, they're passionate, Teens care about the environment. Kids really, teens really care about social justice. Teens do care about our future and our planet. That is wonderful, well more than do adults right now. So I think we should be capitalizing on that. Teens are incredibly creative. We need to be working with teens and young adults in everything that we do because they are our future. And I don't mean that as a cliche. I really mean that. So having the conversation, let them be part of that conversation, help them find out what they think we should do to solve some of the problems. They're the ones to talk to. So I am very optimistic about teenagers. We have 40 teenagers who and young adults who work with us all the time on our work because we trust them. So I think some people are afraid of teens. I embrace them. I think they're fantastic. Love it. Do we know how vaping shapes the teen brain? In other words... Are there any known biological changes in the developing brain as a consequence of, of vaping? And here I'm going to assume it's vaping nicotine. But, you know, we yeah. talked about um, cannabis as it relates to uh, psychosis yeah. earlier. So let's just keep it restricted to um, nicotine. Sure. Well, we know that during the adolescence that nicotine changes the brain wiring. And what do I mean by that? We're actually born with the nicotinic receptors. We're born with the ability to become addicted to nicotine. Same thing with the Um, cannabis you were talking about before. So if we don't, during the adolescent time when we're pruning away and getting rid of the the connections, the neurons that we don't need, what happens is uh, during, during that process, anything that we don't use, that we don't reinforce goes away. Well, if we introduce nicotine in, into our brain, it solidifies, it keeps that that receptor there and also makes it to where our receptor is really kind of, I think of it as like... Um, keys and locks in a key and suddenly you've got that receptor and it says, ooh, you're putting nicotine in there, keep that in there, or cups. It's developing those cups I often think about and filling those cups with nicotine and those cups are your receptors that were already there. You then take away that nicotine and your cups say, I need more. So you're rewiring your brain, you're wiring your brain to be more likely to become addicted and now you're addicted and you need to keep feeding those cups with nicotine or you're going to go through withdrawal. And so that is what is happening during an adolescent and young adult that we don't see in in adults. That's why we really want to keep young people away from nicotine as long as possible. A lot of questions about um, are there negative effects of of pornography on the developing brain? I imagine there's a lot of literature on that. Yeah, I, I don't know as much actually in the developing brain. Um, I'm sure there is. I, I don't know it. There is, but there's clear evidence about viewing pornography around just not having good, healthy sexual relationships because porn is not normal. It is It is not a normal relationship between two people. What you are doing is really making it so that way you... Um, 
you're you're not necessarily developing a healthy relationship with your partner because you're assuming some gold standard out there that may or may not be able to be achieved. So, um, and it also is also a problem with body shaming and the body types that most people don't have and can't achieve, and that's that's another problem out there with with uh, with, with pornography. A lot of questions about how social media impacts brain development. That's probably an entire episode unto itself. It, it but is. It we, is that, that we yeah. could do another time. And we should. And um, if you'd be so gracious to come back and yes. do that, we, we will. Um, I think as a, just a final question, you know, is there any um, information about potential causality between the mental health crisis that we observe in youth and um, let's just say substance use? Um, of the sorts that we talked about today. Obviously the directionality is tricky there. You can imagine that a lot of high GHC cannabis use is leading to more psychosis, but it seems more likely that um, kids are self-medicating Correct. in the face of like immense challenge, you know, not just the lockdowns and the culture around isolating kids from other kids and um, the stress that was on everybody, um, stress generally, the socio-political landscape, social media. I mean, it's hard to not feel like it's at least a cloudier, maybe a darker time than it used to be, but I don't know. I mean, we uh, humans have evolved through a lot. Um, and it. I don't know that it's also fair to say that everyone's, you know, bummed out about what they see. Presumably there's still some optimists out there. So absolutely, uh, there, there are plenty of studies that show the bi-directional relationship between anxiety, depression, mental health, and substance use. You're right, a lot of teens are uh, self-medicating by using various substances to reduce their anxiety, reduce their stress, and, and also just social lubrication, right, of going into a party and, and pre-gaming or going into a party and using drugs to make themselves uh, less stiff, less less stressed during that situation. But more what we're talking about is that they're self-medicating because they're feeling sad or uncomfortable. And this is, they think, helping them. Again, it's not helping. It's making them feel less bad by continuing to use. But we also do know that drugs also lead to suicidal ideations, uh, suicide attempts, psychosis, and other mental health issues. We also know that drugs lead to reduced academic achievement, um, even though there's some potential uh, cognitive reinforcement that's going on, there's also some issues with lack of concentration. The other piece, by the way, that we didn't really talk about a lot, but is the co-use, that we're seeing a lot of teens not just using multiple products, but using them together. So a lot of teens who are chasing cannabis and tobacco because it enhances the high, or they're using cannabis with alcohol and other mixing of drugs, which is... uh, enhancing the high, but not in a good way and very scary uh, for, for young people. And and a lot of times young people don't even realize, like with blunts, which is truly, as I was saying before, using nicotine and cannabis together, that you're actually becoming addicted to both products really simultaneously. And that we're seeing young people who are having mental health issues and depression more likely to use both products. Uh, so definitely linkages there amongst mental health issues and multiple products as well. So polypharmacology. Yeah. Well, I don't want to end on a down note, but I don't think it's a down note. I think uh, what you've done today in sharing with us the, the realistic landscape of what's happening out there and the realistic landscape of what you're trying to do to ameliorate these issues is uh, nothing short of spectacular, meaning uh, as cloudy as it may seem in uh, in our youth, uh, there's also great hope in everything that you're conveying, which is, um, to put it simply, uh, why would you be trying so hard to fix these problems if you didn't believe that they could be fixed? So I, I find great optimism in the message. I also, I like data, and you've shared with us a tremendous amount of data about what's happening what likely needs to change and the optimal change and optimal route to change as well as some, you know, realistic, perhaps less than optimal, but realistic approaches. Like sometimes it's just a matter of harm reduction. There's, we're not going to eliminate these potentially dangerous behaviors or dangerous behaviors. So for all of that, I want to say thank you. It's a tremendous gift to us all. And I know that we have a lot of parents and 
kids and non-parents and um, every age um, and background that listen to this podcast. And uh, what's clear to me is that it's going to be a community effort to try and uh, face all this. And I keep hearing in the back of my mind this thing that you've said several times now that kids know what's happening. We have to have these conversations. They're hard conversations to have um, for any of us. They're uncomfortable for adults to have. But that until we normalize at least the conversation, it's unlikely that we're going to solve these problems. So thank you for your incredible efforts in the research domain and also for helping to normalize and bring about these conversations. They're oh so important. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me for today's discussion with Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felscher. Please be sure to check out the links in our show note captions to Dr. Halpern Felscher's laboratory, an opportunity to contribute to the research in her laboratory, and the zero cost resources that she has provided for adolescent, teen, and young adult health. If you're learning from and or enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's a terrific zero cost way to support us. In addition, please subscribe to the podcast on both Spotify and Apple. And on both Spotify and Apple, you can leave us up to a five-star review. Please check out the sponsors mentioned at the beginning and throughout today's episode. That's the best way to support this podcast. If you have questions for me or comments about the podcast or topics or guests that you'd like me to consider for the Huberman Lab podcast, please put those in the comment section on YouTube. I do read all the comments. Not so much on today's episode, but on many previous episodes of the Huberman Lab podcast, we discussed supplements. While supplements aren't necessary for everybody, many people derive tremendous benefit from them for things like improving sleep, for hormone support, and for focus. To learn more about the supplements discussed on the Huberman Lab podcast, you can go to Live Momentous, spelled O-U-S, so that's livemomentous.com slash Huberman. If you're not already following me on social media, I'm Huberman Lab on all social media channels. So that's Instagram, X, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Threads. And on all of those platforms, I discuss science and science-related tools, some of which overlaps with the content of the Huberman Lab podcast, but much of which is distinct from the content on the Huberman Lab podcast. Again, that's Huberman Lab on all social media channels. If you haven't already subscribed to our Neural Network newsletter, our Neural Network newsletter is a zero-cost monthly newsletter that includes podcast summaries, as well as brief protocols in the form of one to three page PDFs, covering everything from deliberate cold exposure to a foundational fitness protocol, optimizing and managing your dopamine, neuroplasticity and learning, all of which is completely zero cost. And to sign up, you simply go to hubermanlab.com, go to the menu tab, scroll down to newsletter and supply your email. We do not share your email with anybody. Thank you once again for joining me for today's discussion with Dr. Bonnie Halpern-Felscher. And last, but certainly not least, thank you for your interest in science. 